Okay, it's seven, so we're starting. Everyone, welcome to the Risk Five microconference. Uh, this is plumbers. Yeah, the chat's working. Yeah, I loaded a little slow for me, but once it loads, it seems to go. So that's good. Um, okay, so we'll run through the sponsors and thank everybody for sponsoring plumbers because without sponsors, we wouldn't have conferences. I think. <laughs> uh, Diamond sponsor is Facebook. The platinum sponsor, IBM. Gold sponsors, ARM and Microsoft. Silver sponsors, AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat. Speaker gift sponsor is Collabora. T-shirt sponsor is VMware. Didn't I know we're getting t-shirts? Cool. And then LF runs the conference. So that is the extent of my introduction slides. Um, if uh, you haven't been to Plumbers before, this is meant to be a very collaborative conference. Uh, so you're not meant to present a bunch of slides. We're here to have a discussion about kernel development and whatnot. Um, the rules are basically to turn your video off unless you are trying to talk, because um, if too many people have their video on, it could start to chug. Um, you know, keep your mic muted, obviously. It's a little tough to do these collabor collaborative discussions um, remotely, but uh, the system we have here is pretty good. Um, there's a chat down at the bottom left. I'll have that open, uh, I'm moderating the discussion, um, and we'll have various leads for each of the topics um, who have a few slides to help drive the discussion. So that's the extent of it. Uh, we'll wait a couple minutes, and then we'll get the ball rolling. Amar, you were saying about the, <coughs> the timer slide, the end of the yeah. talk slides. Yeah, did I, I have not, them. Did I not up, upload them? I uploaded them in the morning. What are they called? Just a note. <laughs> hey, sorry, David. What's sorry. Up? Just a note on the t-shirts. Yes, uh, we haven't, not everybody has a t-shirt this year. We're not able to physically hand them out and shipping is a pain. But we're using them as motivation to fill in the survey, which is being sent out today after Mad Dog's keynote on so the last 30 years, we're doing a predictions for the next 30 years, and we're going to present you know, what, what you all come up with on, on Friday as the in the closing session. And so uh -huh. the first missions for that survey will be um, able to have a T-shirt shipped to them. Cool. Thank you. And the other thing to comment is please um, use the shared notes to take notes. Typically, we've had readouts from the microconferences on the last day. Again, we, we're not going to do that this year, but it's very useful to archive the notes of, of what we achieved during the microconf. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody uh, in the room, um, if you can help taking the shared notes, that would be great. Other than that, if you have any questions, uh, either you can ask in the chat room, I'm monitoring that, or anybody if, uh, see any questions, just uh, let us know. Or you can turn on your uh, video, raise your hand so that we know you have a question and speaker uh, can stop and then ask ask your question, uh, answer your question. Okay, so T shirt seven oh five. Okay. Uh 
Um, uh, Kumar, I'm making you present. Yeah, go ahead, Adish. I'll switch the slides. Oh, first I have to finish. Oh, I, hold on. Oh, I have to be presenter first to change the slides. Okay, I switch the slides and sure. I'll make it. Okay. I'll... okay, let's get I'm started. I'll presenter as well. Okay. You can, I think you can start. Okay, let's get started everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, so this is the RISC-V platform specification session uh, at the Linux Plumbers Conference, uh, 75 a.m. to 7.45 a.m. Pacific time on, the, on September 21st. Uh, my name is Kumar Shankaran, and I head up platforms and solutions for Vendana Micro, and also head up uh, the chair role at the platforms of the platforms uh, subcommittee, horizontal subcommittee within RISC-V International. Atish, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, I work as a Western at Western Digital System Software Research. I mostly work on Linux kernel, uh, OpenSPI, and U boot for RISC-V, and I have been the vice chair for RISC-V platform group uh, for the last couple of years. Mahirish, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, hey everyone. Uh, I I also work for uh, uh, Ventana Micro and a part of the software team at uh, Ventana Micro. Thanks. Okay. So, between the three of us, we'll be covering the platform spec and at any point in time, uh, you know, stop us. We can open it up for discussions. We have just a few slides. So we'll cover the content and at any point in time, we can have open discussions as well. So let me go to the next slide here. So in terms of agenda, we'll cover three things today in this session. The first is the platform policy. We'll talk about that next, what that means and what it means for the platform spec itself. The second is the platform specification itself. That's a separate document which governs the platforms that we are defining going forward. And then uh, depending on the time permitting, we can cover, we can have an open discussion for other topics that we don't cover during these two sessions. So that's in a nutshell the agenda. Um, moving on to the next slide. So starting with the platform policy. So what is the platform policy? So it's a governing document that governs the policies and procedures that are used for all those five platforms. It's a, it's a frozen document and it's available at the link over there, the Google doc link, and it's a RISC five frozen document. Uh, in terms of the scope and goals of what the platform policy itself covers, so it specifies a common reusable hardware and software environment for portability. And what we mean there is the same software will be able to run on compatible hardware platforms without any modifications. And it also defines the structure, the definitions, uh, the life cycle, naming conventions, branding, and everything else that are used for the various platforms that are defined in the platform spec. So in other words, if you see a term that is used in the platform spec, or if you see a particular naming convention, all of those things will be defined in the policy. So the policy is sort of a governing document that defines the specification. And this policy itself was developed and released by the RISC-5 platform horizontal subcommittee, uh, which is uh, the link for that, uh, the mailing list is, is shown at the bottom there, uh, the list for RISC-5.org, uh, tech Unix platform spec, and that's the mailing list for the platform specification itself. And the group itself operates under the auspices of the RISC-V Software Horizontal Committee within RBI, which is RISC-V International. And uh, so in terms of a goal, our goal is to ensure software and hardware are interoperable. And uh, so we achieve that using a platform specification document. And this also promotes the independent development of hardware and software. So although we are promoting interop between hardware and software, the goal would be to promote independent development of hardware and software, such that they can be uh, individually innovated and things can move on on independent tracks. 
Any questions so far regarding the policy? Yeah, so I have a question. So you said it's frozen. Uh, like, it, what is frozen? Because uh, I can't find like a tag or anything that says it's frozen in the platform specs repo. Okay, the policy is hosted in a different repo. Uh, so that's the, the link that is shown there is the document for the policy. And the platform spec, if you open the spec, there will be a link to this as well in the platform spec. So Pama, the poly, uh, what Kumar meant to say is the, pol uh, the policy is frozen. We're not going to make any changes to the policy. Or you can call it uh, stable. But the spec itself uh, may likely to change a little bit, not like a huge okay, amount. So the spec okay. is not frozen. No. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, that's very different yeah. than the policies being frozen, because the yeah. spec being frozen is kind of a big deal. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're right. I You're right. Yeah. We can call the spec stable, yeah, but not frozen yet. Correct. Yeah, but stable kind of doesn't mean anything, right? So yeah, yeah, fr yeah. frozen is the important one. We've got <laughs> screwed over by stable already enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So the policy is frozen, not the spec, correct? Just to be clear, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the next slide, so platform policy again, touching on what it does. So the, it defines the structure of the, the, the platform specification itself. So each of the platforms will have what's called a mandatory base feature set, which is uh, compulsory for every platform to have. And then it also can have optional extensions covering the requirements of entire market segments like or industries. For example, a mobile or automotive or server, those would be called extensions within the specification. In terms of release cycle and versioning, so the platform spec itself is targeted to have major releases every two years. We're starting with 2022 as the first year, and then the next major version will be 2024. So even years will be, will be the major releases and we move on in that cadence. And then the amendments and extensions can be released in the order in the audio, which is 2023, 2025 and such. In terms of naming and versioning representations, so the platform name itself is prefixed by this risk five word and it's postfixed by the year and the dot separated revision. So like the example you see bottom, like risk five OSA platform 2022. And for machine identified purposes, we also have a, a URI encoded name in the format that's shown below, risk five platform, risk five over platform OSA. 2022.3 and the life cycle itself i won't cover it here it's a uh, it's there in the document you can feel free to read it because there's a lot of material and you don't have the time to cover it today and then we are also working on a platform compatibility test uh, as part of the platform spec which will be a test document for self compatibility and that's been developed we expect to have that released by the summer of next year so that would be like a self compatibility spec that people can use to certify platforms. Do you have any like draft of this or something? Of what panel of the PCT? Yeah. Not at this moment, no. So it's still under discussion. Uh, yeah, so we have a, yeah, not, nothing written down at, at this point. No. And is it going to be the same Linux based thing that people have been kicking around? Because that's kind of terrifying. Yeah, uh, not, it's still being debated as to how we do this. Uh, one of the suggestions has been that uh, there is a UEFI test suite, we can use that as well, and then link all these things together into some kind of a framework that runs um, either using Python or whatever. We haven't discussed that yet, but those are the things that have been thrown around, that there is a UEFI compliance test already, there is an ACPI compliance test already. We just need to, you know, put all these things together in some manner and then get this going. Yeah, yeah, but specifically you're not making folks like boot upstream Linux as the compliance test? No, no, okay. we will not have that, no. Okay. So, yeah, Mama, any, you go ahead, Atish. No, I'm just saying, uh, any thoughts like what they should uh, do as a part of PCT rather than booting upstream Linux? I don't. <laughs> I mean, okay, so compliance testing is really hard, right? The problem with booting upstream Linux is that like, we will be supporting hardware that is not necessarily compliant with the platform spec, right? Because there's a lot of risk five hardware that's not compliant with the pl platform spec. And right, that's true. Even if you ignore like errata and stuff, 
right? So mm -hmm. try to scare up some version of Linux that like both sticks exactly to the specifications and fully exercises the specifications. It's just not really where we're aiming for, right? If that kind of makes sense. Like if you're trying to test user instructions, it could make sense to run those on Linux because then, you know, sure, <coughs> whatever, we're not really messing with that. But Linux does kind of deal with the brokenness of the supervisor side of many things and definitely deals with the brokenness of the platform side of many things, right? So like in an ideal world, one would imagine having a set of tests similar to the other RISC-V compliance tests uh, that exercise the platform spec. The problem is that like those are hard enough to run already if you don't have like if you're not trying to dry, dive into the details of the platform, like they're hard enough to make it in some sort of portable fashion. Uh, try to do that in a way that does expose the details of the platform is going to be like a ton of work. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is there. I mean, yeah, if, if you have the time to put in, that'd be awesome. But uh, trying to be yeah, uh, Linux is going to be a huge mess. Or trying so to make it, booting yeah. Linux the platform compliance test is going to be a huge mess. So uh, the one thing that I didn't get is uh, any platform that is not compatible is not an issue for it. Any platform that is compatible, if we can put upstream Linux, as a, it will not be the only uh, thing in the PCT, but it can be one thing if it uh, makes sense. If it doesn't, it's fine. We can just run some uh, EFI test with after it boots Linux. But I think the only- the problem is uh, that there's way more to boot in Linux than what the platform spec is going to define anytime soon. Correct. But uh, booting so you're platform... Rope, you're roping in all these other dependencies, right? And then Linux itself is going to have all sorts of workarounds for, you know, things that do not, um, like things that are not compliant with the hardware spec, but are in real hardware or vagaries in the hardware spec, or sorry, vagaries in the platform spec old versions of stuff, right? And also we're not going to be aggressively testing the edge cases of the platform spec. We're building like a software stack that runs in production, right? Not a test suite, right? Those are like two very different things. Right, yeah. I think, uh, look, let me interject. If I can, uh, Atish, if you can just, just add one word, right? Yeah, sure. Me, if Pamela, you're right. I think fundamentally you're correct. But what we may do is we may have a version of Linux whether it's coming from upstream or from multiple uh, Linux next trees or whatever, right? A bunch of uh, trees that are there that have the Well, try trees. Linux X is going to be even worse because not only that is is that going to have all the problems of not <laughs> not uh, whatever it's called, but it's also just not going to run because it's <laughs> like it breaks all the time, yeah. right? No, so but, but that's, saying, yeah, yeah. that's a recipe yeah. for no, that. That's, that's fair. Right? So what I'm saying is because we need to test certain aspects of the overall feature set, right? So for that, we may use just a subset of all those things, not just a full kernel that comes from the next nest. Next, that was just an example. For, for instance, right, if we want to test the H extension, <laughs> we may use that part of that, just the patch set that supports the H extension, right? Just an example. Or we need to test DD, or we need to test ACPI support for the uh, for the server extension, right? So we may just use that part or that tree which has ACPI support there, yeah, there. but like that, that is exactly how all the other ACPI platforms ended up being such a mess, right? Because the, the, the definition of what worked was whatever the implementations happened to need, right? I and it's, that goes way off the rails, right? Like that, that's like the, the worst thing a specification can have happen to it is to be taken over by the implementations because then it's not really a spec anymore. So to jump into onto that, that's why we call it a, a platform compatibility test. But the the expectation simply is at that point that we won't achieve full compatibility testing, and there's still uh, an an additional burden on the the implementers to have their own tests. And what Kumar is referring to is is basically the smoke testing, where we don't have our own compatibility testing yet to have um, a, a smoke test that doesn't cover all of the corner cases yet. And then to build up on that because a, a full platform compatibility test suite simply can't be created in six months or even a year. 
sure. I mean, I'm not saying that this is easy. <laughs> That's kind of how I load with the thing, right? But um, my point is that, like, if you couple your compatibility to upstream Linux, you're going to end up with the hardware being compatible. Yes, and that's not going to happen because the job for upstream Linux is to enable everything or as much that is out in the real world. And I mean, we'll be talking later about the D1. And um, that wouldn't be uh, specification compliant, but Linux is eventually going to support it in one way or another. And uh, a platform compatibility suite needs to detect ex exactly this kind of uh deviations from the spec yeah i mean that's what i'm worried about and, and also stuff like yeah i mean like memory like memory regions and stuff we're not going to go aggressively probe for memory you know uh, uh, orderings and whatnot right uh, that, that are going to be mandated by this kind of stuff All right like uh, like this is the kind of stuff where like a lot of things in linux are like conservatively implemented unless there's some reason to do something complicated <laughs> right some performance reason or whatever to do something complicated yeah so we, we did have a, a lot of discussion around it so maybe in uh, future meetings we will continue to discuss this but uh, to my understanding if we do the upstream linux boot testing it should be at like let's say uh, just to ensure that it has right interrupt controllers. It has a device tree that is being passed, or it has, let's say, H extension, all those things are not like memory ordering or uh, those details. It would be more of a broader smoke test rather than uh, checking each and every aspect of the platform check, which is not feasible at all. But I don't know, like, all you're really doing here is just introducing a, you know, like a, a, a critical loop into this system, right? Where like folks have to go effectively announce their hardware and get all these ancillary drivers upstream in order to, right? Cause you know, you're always gonna have clocks and all this sort of stuff that needs to get up for any real SOC, right? Like how, how, like, how, how do we start taking those things when this is not currently not compliant because it doesn't boot right uh, but would be if we merge the code right we end up in this kind of chicken and egg thing where we're always the ones standing there saying whether or not something's compatible yeah point taken right i think I just point well. to yeah, yeah. I agree. yeah so i think this is something we need to keep in mind but point taken uh farmer i think if you're right uh, if the upstream linux itself is like a moving target and things are it's not stable, right? Then uh, that will be uh, like, uh, as you mentioned, like a chicken and egg yeah, problem. I mean, like Linux problem, changes quite that... regularly. <laughs> there, there yeah. are usually commits. <laughs> yeah, move on and the point taken. We, uh, I think, uh, as we discuss this more, uh, we'll uh, bring in all the, the the discussion points as well. Shall we move on? Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so moving on, the next thing, uh, again, continuing on the platform policy. So in terms of conventions, so what are the conventions used within the platform spec? So features are making thing the following structural elements. What's things, uh, what we call requirements are mandatory, which must be implemented. And you'll see this word called deprecated, which means uh, they must be implemented in the current version of the spec of the product. And they are expected to be removed in the next feature version of the spec. So in other words, things that are existing for certain features like backward compatibility or being compatible with existing platforms, but we don't expect them to be used in the future, those will be marked with this deprecated keyword in the platform spec. So, so I have a quick question I, about that. Um, yeah, sure. Just looking at the current platform spec, it looks like there are already some, some deprecated items in there but the, the platform spec hasn't been released yet could could you talk a little bit more about what what those are supposed to mean basically yeah sure sure so uh, you're right so in the current platform spec there are deprecated uh, features and uh, those are what we consider uh, the to be used by the existing platform out there so some of the platforms that are there today would would use some of those features like one of them, if I recall correct, is the UART implementation, the 8250 versus 16550. 
So uh, just to take an example, we think that going forward, that would be uh, removed in favor of the 16550. So when we deprecate a feature, we would say, what is the right feature to be used going forward? Right, so we, there'll be a mandatory and there'll be a deprecated one. So the deprecated one is the one that can be currently used. And then going forward, we expect that to be removed. And then the mandatory one kicks in. Okay, yeah, just as a suggestion, I would say, since the platform spec hasn't been officially released by RVI, to me, it just makes sense to remove all that deprecated stuff at the moment until actually there's, a, there's an approved version out there. Um, all the, the thing so, is, so the ideas, Go ahead. If I'm command, just just one sentence that may clarify the situation. Because the word deprecated or the the term came along because what we're really doing is we're guaranteeing that mandatory is going to be around at least uh, two years uh, from now. So in the next platform spec, and deprecated is simply removing that guarantee. It doesn't necessarily say that this requirement will be removed. It also doesn't say that you're not allowed to have the feature anymore. Uh, it is only a marker that on this specific requirement, we do not guarantee that it's going to be there two years from now. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, um, I would say until we actually release a, a, and ratify a version of this, I would say, I would suggest that we just remove all of the, the deprecated uh sections from the document since there's until it it until it gets ratified and released there's there's not too much point in stating compatibility with it anyway so it'll, it'll just help cut down a little bit on some of the noise in the current document uh but then if we do that poll and the point taken that if we do that poll then the, immediately some of the things will will be gone meaning that uh, like the example of 80 to 50 that I took, right, it's gone. It won't be there at all. And then we'll be mandating things that would make all platforms non-compatible immediately. Uh, are there I'm, any I'm, platforms that are compatible? Yeah, I don't think there are any platforms that are currently compatible. <laughs> I see. Yeah, so a lot of the existing platform will be largely compatible or, I mean, uh, compatible with the base platform. Yeah. And that was the intention to keep these deprecated items actually, so that we have one version of the platform which covers the existing platforms and later we are deprecating. So those uh, platform, uh, pl existing platforms are not left orphaned actually. So. And also the, any platform that's coming up in let's say one year, two year, they're not gonna to switch to let's say advanced interrupt architecture right then. So they will, they may will uh, continue to have PLIC. So that's why PLIC is also a deprecated option but it will be there for at least a uh, platform that exists now and platform that coming up in a year or two or three. But okay, I mean, just looking at what's deprecated, right? Like one of them yeah. is ACLINT with MO software, right? So like that That's one would be, sorry. That's not deprecated, yeah. Click so is deprecated. Only... So Plick plus Aikland option is deprecated and uh, you at 8250 8 is deprecated. Those two are only things that are deprecated. Mark yeah, is deprecated. Okay, I mean, maybe we can talk about this online or something, but like, I'm, I'm not convinced that there's systems that have that combination. Uh, right. So when, it's, when we say Aikland, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's discuss that when we are in that section. So that uh, we can cover the broader topics. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Or we can just talk about it on the mailing list. It's really maybe it's not worth dealing with this here because it's pretty pretty long tail stuff. Sure. Okay. Or we can just spend a couple of minutes uh, during. We are going to cover the, that platform spec anyway. So I mean, we can. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll worry about it. We'll worry about it if it comes up. Let's try to get the, get yes. the ball rolling. <laughs> okay. So quick, uh, yeah, let me move forward here quickly. So uh, claiming compatibility, right, what does that mean? So a platform product basically is compatible if it satisfy, satisfies all the requirements uh, for a base platform. And if it supports an extension, then it supports all the requirements for the specified extension as in the spec. 
And uh, so no platform shall claim compatibility with an extension if it's not compatible with the respective base. And uh, a software from the software side, a software product from claiming compatibility with the platform uh, must again satisfy all the requirements of the platform and extensions. And uh, so overall the software that works on the base platform will also work in the presence of extensions. And lastly, a software that requires an extension uh, may not be compatible in the absence of that extension. And to illustrate this point, I have a picture. Uh, I know some of you might have questions, so let me just go, go to the next slide here, which has a clear picture, this one here. So overall, this is how things look. So we have a base platform in the middle, which is, as the name suggests, a base so requirements. And then we have extensions that add on to what's the base. And uh, then, uh, so at the, from the hardware view, a hardware platform that is compatible with an extension must be compatible with the corresponding base, as mentioned with the blue box below. Well, but while on the right side, this, on the left side, the software viewpoint is that software that runs on a base platform will continue to run without any modifications on a platform that supports extensions. While on the other hand, a software that needs extension support might or might not work on a platform that only has the base framework support. I'll pause here. Any questions on this one? My question is not so much on this, uh, okay. but it's close, I guess. Like, is, is the platform spec compatibility required for all RISC-V implementations, or is it optional? No, it is. It is required for all RISC-V platform implementations, yes. If you want to claim yeah, compatibility. Yeah, but is it required for all RISC-V implementations? Because there's very <laughs> different between saying it's required for RISC-V platform <laughs> right, and for RISC-V. Uh, Palma, it's more of a branding thing. So if you, if any platform want to claim OSA compliance, then they have to go through this compatibility. If they don't want the labeling or branding or anything with the platform side, then they can they can avoid all these things. Okay, so, so you can still have risk five stuff that's not platform. So first of all, there's so going to be first of all there's going to be more platforms than just OSA. So. The, the model that we have is you have multiple platforms. You have OSA for the, the rich operating systems. You have N for deeply embedded, and there can be other things in between. Yeah, that's part and, of the reason why I'm asking because the M the M stuff has almost no requirements, right? You know, exactly. I mean, unless you're doing something wacky, right? By violating basically the M stuff is just like you're not violating any of the other specs, right? So so my assumption would be that everything has to be compatible with one of them and that's why this extraordinarily small one is there. If that's not the case, it's gonna be very hard to kind of corral everything into this spec because we're gonna have all this other stuff floating around. So so we expect other ones in the future. Uh, but for the time being we're going for the big ones, desktop server. Uh, OSA and M for anything deeply embedded, IoT, um, whatever. And within each of these um, lines and each of these platforms, you have the concept of the base platform and the extensions. Uh, that's where you have the is a relationship that we just talked about. But there might be additional ones next to it, and nobody forces you to to have compatibility with a platform if you're risk five compatible. So if you just do your chip that is for your own special market, uh, branded as RISC-V compatible with the profile with the, the ISA, uh, and forget about the platform because it's just for your special market. Well, the platforms are when you have software or, or binary um, compatibility requirements. I guess my worry there is that every hardware vendor thinks they're special until they try to actually run software, right? So like if there's no, if there's nothing to kind of keep this all together, how are we going to get folks to actually use it? So yeah, uh, that's why the branding thing comes, right? So if the platform wants to be claimed, let's say, I don't know what the exact branding would look like. That depends on the marketing and all. We'll know more by Summit. But let's say, for example, they want to be say they want to claim that we are OSA platform compatible. That means it's guaranteed that uh, we'll boot Linux with not a decided upstream or whatever. Decided, but at least they have 
patches for so that they can put Linux or other operating systems. So that means they are OSA platform compatible. So it's an incentive for them rather than a, uh, I don't know, it's a forced uh, handcuff that you have to be made compatible. If they don't want to claim, uh, I think that should, that should be okay. That's correct. So people are free to build their own platforms. Uh, Pamal, the key thing that we are mandating is that if you want compatibility, then you have to follow the spec. But the no, spec it's if you want compatibility with the platform spec, you have to follow the platform spec. Not correct. if you want compatibility exactly. with risk five. So correct. that I'm exactly. super worried about because like <laughs> that, that, that is going to lead to a lot of things that are incompatible. Which one, like, Pamal? You mean the compatibility to risk five versus platform? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if the platform stuff is optional, my worry is that people are not going to follow it. Because like I said, everyone thinks they're special, right? So, how, like, but yeah. Okay, Palma, so this thing actually grows organically, right? We can't cover at this point. We don't know what all segments the virus five will grow eventually. So we have to do this organically and, and include the domains as and when more and more uh, platforms come up, right? So. And we can't really force uh, in. Yeah. Any any vendor comes up with a platform in I don't know where and what what uh, in specification they implement. So unless they want to be known as a oh, platform compatible, uh, they can they they have to follow the spec. But there won't be any either they have to be compatible with something right. They have to be compatible with a profile. They have to be they cannot simply say that we are risk compatible and claim that uh, we can boot up stimulus. That's not going to happen. Why not? I mean, that's, there are many current systems. To do that. Oh, I'm getting some racism on the audio. I don't, is that my end? Uh, so wait. Philip, we are breaking up bad. Philip? Yes, same okay. word, Sorry, uh, Philip, I just need to blow it up. Yes. Go ahead, Pamela. Okay, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. I think Philip's uh, mic was either creating a static noise or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I think I, I clicked the mute button on him. I was just apologizing for doing so, but I couldn't hear anything else. <laughs> so I figured I'd just whack it. Uh, I also forgot what we were talking about. Uh, you're talking about the if the question the bigger question where let's say what prevents a platform to be just claim that uh, they are let's say risk type profile compatible uh philip voice is breaking yeah, it's not, it's not off the rails. philip we cannot do you philip i think it's uh, uh, let me mute him. can you mute him do you know you yeah i just click on him and it mutes him do you know you guys have like his phone number or something? You can call him and tell him that something's screwed up. <laughs> yeah, um, I do, but I think if I step out, then I'll. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, anyway, anyway um, uh, what are we? What, anyway, so so my my worry here is that there are many systems now that are not compatible with the platform spec because the platform spec doesn't exist yet, so people weren't following it. That's fine, right? Those systems exist and boot upstream Linux. So, like, as the platform spec becomes defined and there are systems that can be built that are compliant with it, right, how do we get folks to actually do that when there are a host of existing systems that are not that way, right, and we already support those, right? Th like, this, this is how these things tend to kind of not get followed, right? Like, you know, if, if you had to have platform spec compliance, which right now is very minimal, right? It basically just says you, you, you've got the other bits of the spec, right? Um, in order to have RISC-V compliance, then at least we have, we'd have a chance of getting everything kind of corralled. Maybe a release or two would go by or something. Right? But if that's not the case, we're kind of just going to drag on forever with all these other, other specs. Yeah, all, sorry, all these other platforms that are not compatible with, uh, with, with the main one. Yeah, so I think let me take a start at answering that question. I think good point, Bob. Firstly, right, uh, the one thing is that once this platform spec gets frozen or released, our goal would be to have something or some example platform that follows the spec. So one of the things we are thinking is firstly have QEMU that will 
be a compliant platform that will follow the spec. And then in the first part of next year, we actually have hardware platforms that would again support the spec, right? So there are examples of platforms that will follow the spec. So that sort of sort of creates a cadence of compatible platforms versus people, you know, doing their own thing and then fragmenting the ecosystem again. So I, I hope you can hear me now. I had to read with my entire audience here. Yes, um, they can hear me. The, oh, uh, we have five, five minutes now, guys. Okay. Yeah. And what we have in the policy is we're actually trying to say that people should not create new platforms uh, if they, this is just for fringe interest. So if you're just doing a risk five chip to have your own hard disk controller, you shouldn't be writing uh, a platform specification because this will be a fringe interest. Uh, but we have this in here as a mechanism when software is developed independently, there will be multiple software vendors, multiple hardware vendors, and that's why, why we have this intentional gap that you don't have to, to, to follow a platform. You can still have a compatible chip. Uh, and uh, in that case, there is no statement regarding compatibility. But we expect people to, first of all, want to follow the platform spec and be platform compatible, both with software and hardware, so that they know when they get a Linux distribution off the shelf, it's going to work with the hardware that it's supposed to. Yeah, no, I get we all want people to be compliant with the platform spec, right? Because it's going to be a mess to have all these crazy platforms out there. Like everybody else has seen that before, right? My problem is like, <laughs> how do we make that happen? And if there's no enforcement of the platform spec, it's not going to happen because in practice, that's how these things But uh, practically speaking, how do you enforce? Can, like, you can't call it risk five unless it's compatible with the platform spec, just like uh, the other no, specs. But, no, hold on, but uh, it's compatible with the platform spec, but the, the way the enforcement is going to happen is because people will be moving with their feet uh, on the software investment side. You don't want to have your binary distribution uh, targeting every possible combination and every possible broken platform. Yeah, I totally agree. But in practice, folks are going to build binaries for the systems that run. And this is, we're all talking about kernel stuff here. It's not user space stuff, right? And the kernel is very good at handling weird platforms. If there is a market, people will do that. It, it, it all comes down to, to investment and return on investment. And we can write as many platform specifications as we want, uh, but the only thing that we can do with that is create the branding and the badging uh, that communicates things to people and uh, that has some testing behind it. There will be things happening next to it, and people can build whatever they want if they, if they aren't looking for the risk five compatible with left with a platform logo. Okay, so let me interject here, guys. We have two minutes before the end of the session, and uh, so if it's okay, uh, I mean, this is, these are good discussions, but maybe we can we can move on here because we just wanted to cover one more thing here. So let me just go on. We have like one more minute now. So for 2022, we are defining these two platforms, as you see here, OS A platform, which is like a rich OS platform for Linux, FreeBSD, Windows, and all that stuff. And then within that, there is a base and a server extension. And we are defining an M platform, which is an RTOS platform, again, with a base and a PNP extension. And the schedule was we are shooting for a frozen version by, by Summit in December. So that's the goal. And the link to the spec is up there. And uh, so, Atish, can you uh, share the spec just for like a minute? We'll quickly walk through it and we're done. Yeah. I don't think we have enough time, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, just a minute. I'll just quickly go through the sections within the spec in a minute. And while he's bringing yeah. that up, what I wanted to say is, uh, you know, every, this spec is open to everyone. Everyone can take a look at it. And uh, uh, yeah, so let's just cover the table of contents here because that's all the time we have today. And uh, so as we spoke, the document itself, again, is divided into two sections. The first is for the OS 8 platform, and then we talk about base. Uh, yeah, so base like 2.1, and then we go to the server extension, which is, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, Atish, uh, uh, the server is at the bottom. And uh, yeah, the server extension 2.2. And similarly, there's an M platform. If you further keep scrolling down, there's an M platform definition. There you go, section three. 
And then similarly, within the end platform, there are two sections for base and uh, extension, the BMP extension. Uh, you know, it's, it's been reviewed by some people. It needs a lot more review. It's up open. So there's a link there as I send. You do take a look at it, send us feedback over the mailing list, and we'll, uh, you know, gladly take all your comments and respond. And it's an interactive uh, community here. So feel free to suggest whatever you think is the right way to move forward. Right. And then uh, that's all. So, I mean, you can see the sections here. So we have gone through a lot of detail in putting uh, the respective features in each of the sections. For instance, PCIe, you see here, there's security, RAS, these are part of the um, server extension. And then above, if you scroll up a little bit, uh, back to the table of contents, Satish, like page two. Yeah. So page two, we talk about, you know, general ISA profile requirements for the base, uh, then the PMU stuff, PMU counter requirements, debug support, interrupts and timer. So there'll be an interrupt session happening next by Anu. And then we also talk about system peripherals, boot process, uh, open SBI, UEFI, everything that right, is covered here. And uh, that's, yeah, that's the structure of the document. I think I'm pretty much out of time here, but any other questions or comments, we can take it over the mailing list. And uh, any last words, Atish, from yourself? No, I'm just saying I can ask the questions in the chat also. It seems to be working. So we'll be monitoring that and we can uh, try to answer some of them. Okay, that's all folks uh, for this session. Thank you all for attending. I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll switch to the next presenter. Anupa, I'm making you presenter. Okay. Do you want to share your slides or should I just uh, show the slides here? Yeah, you can just show. I can. Yeah, just it. click. Yeah, you can just uh, click the left plus button and then you should be able to switch the slides. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the slides, right? Yeah, we can see the slides. Okay. Okay, so uh, I guess we're, I'm, I'm running two minutes short, anyways. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Anup. Uh, I work for Western Regional System a Software Research Group along with Atish. Uh, and uh, I've been doing a lot of open source contributions like kernel, open SBI, uh, then U-Boot and other stuff. And and on the, the RISC-V international side, uh, I have been for a year I've been chairing the, the AIA group, uh, the task group, uh, which is responsible for coming up with the new interrupt controllers for the RISC-V platforms. Uh, so I'm here to talk about that today. Uh, so and and yeah. So I'll just uh, uh, first give a brief overview of the the specs that uh, we have been working on and the AI group and the platforms group as well. And then uh, we'll move towards the discussion. And at, and in between, like feel free to just stop me and just ask questions. And since these these are really relatively new spec. Uh, 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 I want to spend some time in overview, so like I'll spend like 10, 15 minutes on the overviews. I'll, oh yeah, these are like relatively big specs, so maybe I might not be cover, uh, able to cover all the features of the specs. So we'll start with the, the AI uh, spec, okay. Uh, so first of all, the, why we started uh, thinking about uh, having a new interrupt control is that the existing platforms mostly have, all, all of them have actually RISC V PLIC, okay, or originally which was sci fi PLIC actually. And this is widely used. I mean, any, I mean, uh, almost all list fiber, even uh, embedded ones and the Linux capable ones have this plate actually. Um, the problem with the, the, some of the problems that were brought to our notice or in one way or other were, are, are as follows uh, the, the mentioned over here as limitations. So first of all, is like it takes, uh, the, the address space is quite sparse. It takes like a lot, lot of amount of physical address space. So just to give an example on the sci-fi uh, sci uh, unleashed actually, if it's just four hearts, it takes more than two MB of physical address space. And then worst case, it can go up to 16 MB. And then, then there's also issues like the, all the address registers are not grouped properly. I mean, uh, let's say if you have a same click targeting both M mode and S mode, uh, uh, then there's no uh, pro proper protection of the global registers which can influence the interests which are being routed to the M mode from the S mode. So that again becomes a problem. Uh, then there is no configurable IRQ cell line sensing or how to uh, uh, configurable way of uh, changing the uh, way the interrupts are sampled by each IRQ line. Uh, right now it's like kind of hardwired in each uh, platform which integrates this click. So, uh, and uh, of course there is no MSI support and there is no virtualization support as well. Yeah, 
and to solve these problems of course and give new features uh, so that the interrupt support in risfi platform is like in feature parity with major architectures uh, this ai group was formed and then then there we have this pack so the the ai stands for advanced interrupt architecture okay uh, i didn't name it so leave it the name <laughs> uh but the spec is in quite stable state uh, we have done lot of pocs in past 8 months and uh, so it's an and and the goal is uh, from the uh, risk finder is that we, it's supposed to be ratified by by summit or at least frozen by summit at least so so at a high level actually uh, it has three distinct components uh, one is the new csrs uh, what we call it like extended local interrupts uh, extending the fee functionality of the local interrupts that is already there and then we have the uh, the most highlighted part of the spec which is the im6 or the incoming message signal interrupt control which primarily handles the msis and then we have the advanced plic or the advanced platform level interrupt control so uh, so the a plic is not backward compatible to plic just to clarify but we have a dual plic mode which is like a plic and the new plic can coexist if people want that level of compatibility so that's that but that's a separate topic and is that defined in the as a separate chapter in the spec i'll not go through that that part uh, and, uh, and 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 the the point behind uh, keeping the ai spec modular is that uh, platforms can uh, implement only the required parts of it uh, for instance if we have a low end system uh, running linux which does not have pci or any msi then do, they don't really need to implement the the insic okay and for that matter if they don't even have virtualization they don't even need to go for the ai csrs as well they can just add just the aplic part of it and then, then they are done so that's and that's why it's modular actually so just to quickly go over like uh, the high level features like so the extended local interrupts actually uh, allows uh, the platforms to provide 64 local interrupts for both rv32 and rv64 modes uh, and and the priority is now configurable so at this point the right now the previous spec does not define any uh, priority clearly for each local interrupt but this will have a configurable priority and uh, uh, it also has a uh, interrupt filtering support uh, uh, which means that uh, uh, higher level previous mode can take the interrupt first and then uh, forward it instead of directly delegating it uh, like the previous spec does okay and the original behavior of uh, local interrupt 0 to 12 will will be defined by the previous specification uh, previous uh, spec and and that will not be modified by this uh, ai csrs so actually the csrs are totally backward compatible so uh, in a newer system with the ai csrs if we run an older software it should be totally fine it will not break and uh, it also has additional csrs specially for imsic uh, uh, to for, for faster access because the imsic is like kind of indirectly access through csrs only but then we have uh, csrs to uh, for faster access just for the imsic and moving on to imsic as such uh, so uh, imsic uh, requires each hard to have its own uh, imsic instance and each imsic imsic instance will have multiple interrupt files so there will be like one m m level file one m level interrupt file there will be an s level interrupt file and there will be multiple vs level interrupt files and having all the files are not mandatory uh, for implementations which don't have hx session they can just skip uh, the vs file they don't need that and for implementation they really don't want uh, the s mode then they can just go for m file m file only so it's quite modular in that sense as well and each each file actually has two parts one is the configuration and the its own state which is configurable through the csrs and then the, the external part of it is through the physical address space where we have 4 kb for each file and it will have just couple of registers which are the msi registers where the devices can write or other cpus can write and uh, and the, and for imsic the ai csr is kind of become mandatory uh, and it supports up to 2047 interrupt identities and and yes it also supports msi virtualization uh, which is through the vs level files any questions so far uh, Anup, uh, there is a question in the chat where it says, "Why is the address space usage is a problem?" I think it refers to the click uh, <coughs> click address space. Yeah, yeah. So that problem was brought to our notice by some of the low end embedded guys. Uh, uh, they were complaining that uh, why we need to have so much uh, reserve, so much address space because they were thirty bit platform and then they don't want to reserve so much for. <laughs> just for a plic 
So uh, that, that's when we hit that, okay, low end systems, a really low end system will hit this problem actually, why they are resorting so much. Because uh, even though they have this 4 GB of address space, they really want to still cut it down and address, they want to reduce the address comparators and what, so. Yeah, PA space can be pretty expensive. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the A plic. Uh, so one major change with the A plic over plic is, yeah, of course, the uh, physical address space consumption will be less compared to the plic, of course. But then, like I said, we need to clearly isolate the the, the register which will control the interest being routed to the M level from the S mode, and we need the, and we'll be able to protect those registers using PMP and all those things. In addition to that, it also adds a, a hierarchy of uh, A plic in uh, domains uh, where all the wires, uh, wired interrupts coming from the devices will connect to only the root domain, and then the root domain can delegate to child APLIC domains, and, and then implementation can select the number of domains it wants. I think a decent number would be two, like a root and just one S-level domain. A single root is also fine. Uh, for example, in case of virtualization, we generally emulate only one APLIC domain, that's it. Uh, it just directly targets the S mode. And uh, configuration is totally memory uh, through memory map registers. And yeah, like I said, yeah, CSRs are not required actually uh, for APLIC. If you, if a platform just wants APLIC, just wired interrupts, it does not need to uh, implement other parts of the spec. And it has target registers, which were not there in the PLIC, which allows to us to directly tar pinpoint and target a particular IRQ to a particular heart. So, and uh, it supports up to 1023 um, interrupt sources, wired interrupt sources, and up to 16384 hertz. So another unique feature of this APLIC is that it supports two modes. One is a direct mode and MSO. The direct is like no brainer. It directly APLIC injects interrupt directly to the hearts without anything in between. But the MSI mode is a bit more interesting, uh, where it actually converts all the wired interrupts into MSIs and uh, forwards them as MSIs to the to the actually M6, so which allows both APLIC and M6 to coexist together nicely. Yeah, so just just, just to uh, for benefit of everyone, I try to prepare some figures so that the 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 figures are the high level thought is in everyone's mind when when the patches land and people have uh, people can provide good suggestion in the reviews of patches. So this is what I was talking about. The, if we if it just look at the IMSIC or the IMSIC part of the things and the local uh, CSRs, each heart has its own local CSRs, and each IMSIC is like uh, per heart, and where each IMSIC further has multiple files which dif for different privilege modes, and yeah, of course people can have only implement only required number of files. Uh, so and the devices will directly shoot MSI. So the dotted lines in this figure is the rights MSI rights. And the hard lines or solid lines are nothing but hard wire connections. Okay, so this is what basically what uh, I explained about the MSIC. Uh, any questions on the MSIC so far? Sorry, I think we're all still arguing about the previous session in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't have two two discussions at once. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Yeah. Cool, moving on. Yeah, so same thing, like I said, like the, uh, if we just have wired interrupts like on any platform, uh, we really don't need an IMSIC in that case. In that case, it will look something like this, but I have shown only two domains over here. Uh, it can have more domains or just a single domain as well, okay? Uh, but then the cool thing is that we have a separate M level domain and a S level domain, which means that uh, now we can protect the uh, the M level stuff and the M level I have to separately using PMP and other stuff, even I have PMP we can configure for that or some other protection. So the S mode will only have the access to the APLIC domains which are meant for S mode only or S level. And yeah, so since this system does not have MSI, so all, all even PCI devices and all MMR will directly uh, inject interrupts as wired interrupts only. Yeah, and this is a more full-blown case of the system having both uh, the APLIC and the IMSIC. Like I was saying, uh, um, all the wired interests will always connect to the root domain, and then they can delegate to either some of them to S mode or handle directly in M mode. And and the the typically PCI devices will directly inject uh, MSIs to the S level, and 
the aplix in this case will run in the msi mode and they will convert the uh, wired interrupts as msi and inject to appropriate uh, in sic files so this is like the high level view uh, the larger view i would say behind the whole uh, ai thing it, it covers almost all three components in this figure actually i guess people are still busy with the previous session or okay so moving on so yeah so the immediate question is that uh, okay uh, if we have totally random organization of all these files in the memory map then the aplix won't be able to actually inject uh, and the aplix hardware will need to have a separate base address addresses and for each uh, target in six which would be more expensive for hardware as well so what we came up with this is that uh, we have this notion of MC, uh, 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 recommended way of arranging msic files in the physical address space uh, which which has this notion of a msic group uh, msic group is nothing but uh, hearts uh, co-located uh, hearts with having all the msic files as co-located in the physical address space and so the group can also be thought of as uh, as a, a cluster uh, within a soc or it can be also thought of as a die in a multi die system or a chiplet or a, or a socket in a multi socket system as well so this this figure actually shows uh, how how that will be organized into let's say we have a multi group system then how would the files be organized typically the m files will be co located to each other within a group and then the s files will be there supervised level files and within s files we'll have the vs file and s file separately co located yeah i guess this has been older right like we can skip this this is too much on, into the spec so this is like saying the same thing but how the aplic expects and even the aplic assumes this arrangement so that we can configure uh, the target registers when it is in msi mode to target appropriate uh, uh, m6 uh, in the interest of time i'll just skip this thing because uh, it will just take more time any questions still now for the aia Am I audible or am I just? Yeah, you're audible. I think everyone's okay. just. Uh, there is yeah, interrupt. The There's <laughs> too many other discussions going on, and this is quite deep stuff. Sorry, Anup. Uh, no, no, no problem. Yeah, it's okay. right, being right after the big argument session it tends to get. Yeah, <laughs> once we figure out how to create a bop, probably we'll set up a bop for this. No, just kidding. Uh, no, we can yeah. continue. There are no questions until now. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was speaking to myself, but anyways. Okay, so and a very short introduction about the Aiklin. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, based on the comments I mean so far, like uh, I think there is a confusion about the the Aiklin how I approach it. So Aiklin is totally backward compatible. Okay, so we need not to worry, and all the existing platforms are already compliant with the Aiklin, so to say. So okay, why Aiklin is that uh, we are already familiar with Sci-Fi Clint, and we have almost all systems having Sci-Fi Clint at the point. which basically provides a m mode timer and a m mode software interrupts okay uh, but then there are problems okay then we ran into some of these problems when we were defining the platform spec so first of all the problem we ran it was like we once we have a system like uh, aia which has uh, m6 and everything we really don't need the ipi part of the the client uh, sci-fi client actually because we can always use the m6 to inject ips to each other actually yeah. and which becomes even more faster in case of virtualization because we can totally inject ips to each uh, the each virtual hard, virtual cpus to each other in a trapless way so uh, that's when we want wanted to define sci uh, the clean take the sci fi clean spec and define in a more modular way so that we can just implement uh, platform can just implement the timer part of it and then the pro another problem was uh, the, the, there is no provision for uh, s mode software interrupts uh, which means that as linux and other always they will end up doing sbi calls most of the times 
so there needs to be some provision at least and for, particularly for the low end systems in future as well where it will have just a plic it will not have plic but it will just have a plic in the, those system as well we need some provision for for the as mode to inject into uh, as ipa directly another problem also what what was like brought to our notice is that okay we might end up with situations where we have multi cluster systems uh, where the compare registers of a timer are local to the clusters but the m time is somewhere else uh, physical m time register so at least we need to define the m timer or the m m, m o timer such that uh, uh, at least two different m timers can share the same physical m time register so based on whatever i the limitations i spoke and other things we came up with this a modular spec is basically sci-fi clean plus the modularity and the new stuff but the new stuff is only the as mode software inter that's all so you we can also so we have three devices okay now uh, targeting separate functionality one is the m timer another is the mswi another is sswi and then now the sci-fi client is also a client device just we can think in one sci-fi client device as two a client devices at, at this relative offset range so that's why i say that existing platforms are already compliant with the risp a client any questions on the eclin part uh, or... yeah could you talk a little bit more about um why it's important for it to be whatever spec is defined here why it's important for it to be backward compatible with the with the existing client yeah so backward compatibility was like one of the requirements we we got in ai context as well in other that uh, the existing platforms need not be orphaned so fast and the other thing is uh, the modularity as, as such the, the required in the eclint spec so and, 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 and there was no as such uh, issues if you see uh, the limitations what i have highlighted what we got so far and nothing to do with the functionality of the things as such is just the new newer system needs more modularity and more uh, sh uh, sharing of some of the resources like m time register so as such we didn't require to break the the uh, the functionality as such and another thing was if you look at the risp v privilege spec the particular the machine mode part it clearly defines a uh, expected behavior of a memory mapped m time and m time compare so anyways we can't violate that behavior from uh, with the risp v privilege spec as well so so that part has to be compliant with the risp v privilege spec and also it has to be compliant with the sci fi client as well Paul, did i answer your question or did i confuse more more <laughs> no it's it's fine i think we need to it, at some point and probably the the rvi group is the right place to discuss it is yeah, just sure. just to get a little bit more clarity on on whether that's that's really a, a a key requirement for this. That's all. Yeah, mainly you you can see there is a clear distinct uh, section in the in the privilege spec about the m time expectation around the platform m time and m time compare registers. So if we try to align with that, we are already compliant with the sci-fi client. So okay. So one last thing regarding the overview. So we talked about AI, different things that AI has. We talked about eClient and the three modular devices it implements. So where, where, where does this whole thing actually fit into the, the platform spec that is coming up? So out of all these things, we came up with like uh, potentially three categories or classes of interrupt supports or four categories at this point, uh, which can be there in any platform at this point. Okay, first is the legacy wired RFUs, which is right now marked as deprecate which essentially is this combination the whole row actually okay it does not mean that the whole row will be deprecated all the devices will be deprecated is the combination that is de deprecated so which is essentially meaning that uh, a system with a plic and mswsi and uh, m timer so so both these are part of sci-fi client so instead of having a separate sci-fi client spec we can just point to this combination that's all and uh, the next is the immediate upgrade on the existing legacy wired IRQ system is an only wired IRQ system which uses the newer components, namely the APLIC M level domains, APLIC S level domains, and more uh, ACLINT uh, modules like so. So in the legacy, we don't have anything to inject interrupts in the S mode. So uh, over here, we are on this case, we are actually uh, asking, since there is no IMSIC, we are asking 
to have a mandated SSW IDOS, which allows Linux to directly inject, inject interrupts without SBI calls, okay, directly to the OS mode. Okay, but this does not talk anything about VS level at this point because the aclint as such does not support virtualization. So it's just more about documenting the old stuff. So in a in a more modular way. And then the new thing also is that in that second row is the, the pre SSTC, which brings adds more CSRs for direct uh, programming timers in the S mode uh, without doing SBI calls. So that, that stuff is still in progress. And, and, and in all this diagram also, uh, the colored boxes are kind of either work in progress or already complete. So, so wherever I've written phase one and phase two, those things are done. And when there is a, where there is a in progress, that's still work in progress. As far as POC goes, not the spec. And the fourth, co the third combination is, again, will be more combination, uh, more common also, is that uh, we'll have a system with MSI and wired IRQs, which means it will have M6. But it will not have a virtual MSI support, which means people it's a bit kind of mid-range system uh, which does not need that much virtualization. Uh, but it needs MSIs and wired IRQs, which means it has P P PCI and, and, and a few set of uh, uh, wired peripherals. So in this case, uh, SBI, so in this case, we'll mostly have uh, IPIs done through the M6 actually. And rest of the things are same. Uh, MSI is for MSI and APLI for wired interrupts. And yeah, as you can see in the M, uh, the timer, M level column, the M timer part of the ACLIN still gets reused. So, and that's where the modularity of the ACLIN come into play. Uh, we don't need to have a full blown sci fi client. We just need the M timer part of it. And that's it. So, this will also stay compliant with the privilege spec as well. So, and the last is uh, uh, at this point will be the kind of most advanced system which has even the virtualization support in the M6, and that's why you see even a VS level M6 file over there. Uh, so the rest of the things are same as the previous row. Yeah. Any any questions in this thing? Uh, this is related to the platform spec we, which we were discussing in the previous discussion. Yes, yeah, so the uh, first option was the one. Uh... Uh, when we say legacy, means like yeah. that was the mark as deprecated in the platform spec. Yeah. So it's the combination that is deprecated, not yeah. the components, right? So. Yeah, exactly. For the reason we described. So any questions we want, uh, we can discuss now. Like why it is uh, being deprecated or anything? Uh, I have a question about the what about what I O interrupt line is. Why no one or the MSI is why? Because I met the most uh, uh, performance problem for the what I owe is about the what notify and the PRS emulate. It costs very, very so much uh, emulation pace uh, to to handle the what I owe interrupt currently in our uh, virtualization implementation. So how we solve the Vertio device uh, notify and uh, uh, interrupt uh, handler to increase the performance to prevent uh, the virtual machine uh, VM exist or enter. So 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 one thing is that uh, you uh, whatever need not be always on the as MMI bus. So let's say you have the last combination which has the uh, what uh, M6 VS file. Okay, in that case, uh, it can very well be a Vertio PCI transport for the Vertio. Okay, or well, a PCI transport for the Vertio. In that case, whenever uh, uh, the Vertio will inject into it, will be simply a MMI write, and uh, and the VMs will typically process the MSI in a tra totally trapless manner. There is uh, there is there'll be no traps at all. So so. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, I I got uh, uh, I got a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, but how to handle the notify? I mean, some for example, the the standard uh, what I O front end the driver uh, using the what I O spec, and uh, and uh, if and uh, and uh, when he want to notify the host, he just write the notify uh, uh, in the count config register and that will cause the uh, MMIO emulation and it's a long pass. Uh, um, I just uh, uh, a question is how 
how could how could we solve this problem in your spec? Is that possible? Or oh, oh, because uh, we we have uh, measured the some cost of this uh, scenario. It's cost a long uh, a, uh, a very uh, about twenty percent of the performance. Uh, that means if we using some hardware mechanism to to let the notify directly give out to the host and uh, and the guest didn't uh, uh, VM exist, then the the performance will increase immediately. Okay, yeah, so uh, if I understand correctly, so your problem is the reverse. So all this spike or the interrupt controller, in fact, in other artists as well, if you see, most of the interrupt control reverse virtualization is all about from the host to the guest, how you can deliver the interrupts in a fast manner or without, tra without traps and accelerate those things. And what you are asking is the reverse thing where you want the reverse notification to be faster. And that's kind of an, a new way, I would say, okay. And okay, it's kind of overlapping with this, but it's not exactly interrupt control. It's the, it's very centric to virtualization where you want a reverse notification from the guest to the host to be faster. Probably it needs a uh, fresh thought in a different way, but it, it has, I mean, it, it looks similar to what we are trying to solve here, but I think it's nothing to do with that because like over here, the problem is the host interrupt controllers and the virtualized support uh, support in the host interrupt controllers as such. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, this is the, I mean, new research idea, I would say. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I, I, um, okay. Uh, is this question? Uh, okay, I mean, uh, uh, how do you think uh, let your spec connect to the virtual spec? That means a little bit, bit misc. That means uh, your AEC, your, your, how to say that, your AIA, yeah, your AIA specification contains some what I O specification. That means to solve some what I O problem. However, it is like I, I, in the in the recent KVM forum, there have been a lot of talks around the VDPA. Okay. So, and then you can always have an, the what I being totally accelerated by a hardware and where the hardware will have two sides of interrupts, one interrupt on the host side where the, using that interrupt, the hardware will uh, accelerator, what I accelerator will directly notify the host. And then the, the forward thing is also there. Uh, the, you, the, these interrupt controllers can be used to directly inject interrupts through uh, to the guest. So uh, again, the answer is over there also what I saw, most of the optimizations around the VDPA were to put more things in hardware, accelerate what I have with hardware. So, and that would actually accelerate what you are saying, the reverse path as well, the guest to uh, host as well, because now the what I have is actually totally in hardware. So, and you can just have a simple interrupt line directly being taken by the host. There is no. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, if we want to, if we want to solve this problem, maybe we also will, uh, will, will uh, involve some custom, custom design. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Will, yeah. Like I said, it's a research topic. It will require some uh, new hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. And and sometimes how to upgrade it is the problem. So I think uh, if the if the uh, if if you can take care of this, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's, it's much more easy for us. So at least for AI, I would say at least the the goal. I mean, all of whatever is set out for this year has been already completed. POC has been done. So if if people think this can be solved through AI, maybe the AI 2.0 when people work on that can address this problem. Try to address this problem if they can think. Or I mean, there is already a lot of uh, work going on with the DPA and hardware accelerators for what I have. So that that will be another topic. Uh, yeah okay another topic okay yeah. okay thank you yeah yeah so we're kind of out of time yeah i know so, that was... but, so I but think, anyways, uh... anyways i've uploaded the slides I, these, these slides are not the latest one i have added more figures for people who want to get started reviewing and following this stuff actually i have added more detailed slides just for the see uh, for the benefit of everyone okay so they can pull the latest slides from the, from the plumber site and go through it and if you have questions just email us so uh, so we have uh, 15 minutes break now so if you have any questions uh, you can ask Anup or continue discussion here as well okay but officially we are on break so if you have any anybody else has a question you can continue discussion
So I'll just take over the presentation and uh, switch to the break slides. Sure. And uh, we'll be back at uh, in 10 minutes with uh, next session as ACPI for us five. Amar, where is it, where is that slide uh, with all the detail talk details and the break? Can you share that one? Yes, Palmer is not here. Yeah, he's probably uh, not at this desk. Then I got it. So we are done with two talks. Now we are at break. Okay. Tish, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is a pretty cool slide, Akesh. How did you get this thing done? You change the uh, the highlight after every session? I uh, just different slides. Oh, I see. Okay. So, Kumar, uh, I'm trying to set up a BOF to continue the platform specification discussion. Okay. So, uh, so that uh, <clears throat> we can discuss all the things that were uh, incomplete. Uh, probably it's uh, set up on Friday. Sure. Does it sound okay? Yeah. Yeah. Friday, same conference time around maybe 10 15. 10 15 a.m. PST. Or, or, or yeah, uh, I'm still confused with the time slots it shows, but uh, it should show up in calendar. So, uh, is it a live session you mean? Yeah, yeah. So Bob means uh, it's an informal discussion session. So we can just focus on the platform uh, dis related discussions uh, with everybody concerned. Whoever has questions, so uh, we can discuss. Yeah, I think David also shared a link out to that. Okay, I think we can start, right? Yes, we can start. Okay. 
Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the session today. I'm Sunil working for. Sunil, uh, just just uh, sorry, uh, just to interrupt. Just wanted to say one thing is, uh, can you just give the context uh, why uh, you have the because we didn't cover this in the platform, so you have the slide uh, saying it's ACP is mandatory for server extension, right? Uh, yeah. I mean. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then continue. I'm, sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, so this session we are going to discuss how we can enable ACPI for RISC V, uh, which is a key requirement for enabling server class platforms. Uh, as Atish mentioned, we have made it mandatory in the platform specification for server extension. So here's the agenda for the presentation part of the talk today. I mean, uh, plan to quickly finish up this presentation in 10 to 15 minutes and rest of 15 minutes is available for discussion. Um, first, we will briefly talk about why ACPI for risk -wise server class platforms. Uh, these questions are already answered for other architecture, so I don't want to go in detail about this, but still as a, a first starting point, we will discuss about this. And there are some hardware requirements we have put for ACPI uh, enabled platforms. We will discuss about that. And then what it takes to enable at least basic KCPI support for RISC-V. Uh, we have done some investigation and uh, uh, based on that, we will discuss what it takes. And based on that, we have done some proof of concept work and we'll share what, what changes we have done to uh, boot ACPI enabled kernel, RISC-V kernel on QMU. And uh, this is mostly a basic uh, enablement of ACPI. Of what what are the pending things or advanced features of ACPI which we need to enable uh, in future? We'll uh, discuss about those uh, next steps. And I have put it as Q&A at the end, but uh, this is uh, more of a discussion. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point of time uh, with your feedback or any questions. So why ACPI for RISC-V server class platform? So, uh, basically, ACPI is the preferred choice of enterprise hardware OEMs or voice vendors because of various good reasons. And uh, in, in a way, for some vendors, it is actually a mandatory requirement. And uh, these requirements and reasons are already documented for ARM64 server, documented well by grant. And, uh, and RISC-V is not an uh, exception for these reasons. So this learning from ARM experience we have adopted in our platform specification and made ACP as the mandatory hardware discovery mechanism for server class platforms. And the plan uh, regarding the hardware requirement, the plan is to support ACPI for 64-bit RISC-V architectures and which has only AIA interrupt controllers for the reasons why uh, uh, we are mandating ACPI for server class platforms and server class platforms need a scalable uh, interrupt controllers. So that's why we are mandating AI interrupt controllers and also that supports MSI. So what that means is uh, currently there, is, there, are, there are no platforms uh, which can support ACPI today. Uh, so all we can do is uh, work with QMU uh, kind of emulated platforms. So here is the high level overview, how we can enable or what is what it takes to enable ACPI for risk five. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. So can we, uh, the, for ACPI spec doesn't require any hardware uh, thing, right? So you can potentially uh, bring uh, create a ACPI table for let's say existing platform high five one match and you can test it, is that correct? Now, the thing is, we need to update the ACP specification uh, for interrupt no, specific for, interrupt. Just for uh, proof of concept. Oh, you mandate AIA in ACP. Sorry. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Server platforms. Yeah. Uh, so okay, I think so. the focus is only on the, the, the server platform, right? So if it yeah. was based, he would have to do that click and other things as well. So. Exactly. Yeah. So here is what it takes to enable basic ACPI booting on RISC-V. Uh, as most of you know that uh, EFI system table provides the pointer uh, to the root of the ACPI, which is called RSDP. And uh, 
I mean, in terms of ACPI, if you if we can broadly categorize into static tables and uh, uh, dynamic ACPI namespace. In terms of static tables, uh, the RSDP will have a pointer for uh, which is relevant for 64-bit architectures uh, is XSDT, and XSDT has multiple uh, uh, pointers to multiple tables, and uh, depending on the requirements, it can be. Uh, there are many tables which which are kind of optional and. Uh, uh, based on features we can implement uh, many of them but for the just for the basic support of uh, acpi we need uh, the main, uh, important table which is called MADT is uh, multiple epic dis description table which provides the uh, interrupt controller information and uh, uh, this MADT specification uh, uh, is there in the uefi uh, sorry acpi specification however the internal structures are according to the um, cpu architectures for example intel will have sapic and uh, arm will have gig kind of thing so similarly for risk 5 we need to add uh, interrupt controller uh, related data structures into this uh, specification of MADT. And in this, as uh, Anup mentioned, we have uh, three different types of uh, kind of interrupt con controllers. So the int C, the local interrupt controller per heart, uh, we need uh, per heart or per CPU structures. And uh, a logical uh, single IMS IMSIC node, uh, even though IMSIC is per heart, we have uh, representation uh, as a logical representation in single node and uh, applic domains which is kind of per chip or per domain per uh, socket and apart from madt uh, we have we need other tables like mcfg for pci express support memory map configuration table and we need another table uh, for timer description for initializing the arch timer driver in the uh, kernel so this needs uh, some information re uh, related to timer and one more table, uh, which is uh, processor properties topology table. This one is not really mandatory for booting for other architectures, mainly uh, ARM64. However, we are uh, planning to uh, uh, add some extra uh, structures into this, uh, which I will discuss in the coming slides. I need feedback for that also, and make it mandatory for booting the uh, RISC-V kernel. On the right hand side, FIDT, uh, there's one more table called FIDT fixed uh, SCPI description table, which has a pointer to DSDT. And this DSDT is a special table because it is encoded in uh, AML uh, language. So basically, we need AML interpreter to uh, work with this uh, table. This is called SCPI namespace, which gives system information like processors, peripherals, etc. In this uh, namespace, we, we need to add uh, APLIC. Uh, interrupt controller because applic driver comes after the acp and namespace is available and uh, that needs a different driver architecture so applic uh, will be there in the acp and namespace and uh, this one also we need to request a new acp id or pmp id from uh, uefa forum and uh, uh, this one will support underscore mat method to get the uh, interrupt controller information in terms of uart we will reuse the a device property uh, uh, method underscore DSD uh, to uh, communicate the clock frequency and other device properties for the UART. So this is the overall uh, requirements to enable a basic ACPI for RISC-V. Uh, whatever I have marked in a red, they all need uh, specification updates for which we need to submit the uh, change request to the UEFI forum. Uh, so this will go through the community driven uh, ecr process and uh, uh, feel free to provide uh, your feedback that will be uh, really helpful uh, for finalizing these things okay and, uh, are there and any how questions? are people supposed to um, provide feedback there and review the specs so uh, what we are planning to do is we'll send it to the uh, our uh, tech unix platform spec alias and uh, we can get feedback um, do you have any other uh, community in mind? Uh, Sunil, uh, you might also want to touch base upon where the processor features would be there, right? So. Right, right. I will. I'll come to that, uh, Anup. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, did I answer uh, previous question? Uh, How about the APRC? APR, APRIC. And uh, this interrupt controller is not, it's different from the 
which you mentioned, which Anuk mentioned. Mm, no, this is these are all AIA interrupt controllers. IMSIC, APLIC, and uh, uh, INTC are all part of the AIA. So the Anoop driver needed to pass the ACPI uh, table to initialize his driver. Yeah, no, driver will support both uh, DT based as well as uh, ACPI based. Uh, Anoop has uh, developed uh, a DT based driver and uh, have done the ACPI based driver. So the same driver will be uh, will be uh, working with both. Okay. Uh, could we just uh, remove the API description table from uh, 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 ACPI XML? XML. Uh, no, this is a mandatory because uh, without that, system will not boot. Okay, and that means the driver needs needed to take care of the ACPI if we enable the yes. ACPI. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, driver needs to be ported. Driver needs to be ported to support both DT as well as ACPI. Yeah. If I using, if I have used the ACPI, could we use the device tree together? No, no. So I okay. think. The, okay. Okay. Let me also try to answer this one. Is that the driver will be written for both uh, the ACPI as well as DT? The kernel will be a unified kernel image. Which means that uh, Linux, like I like we discussed previously, Linux will not just care about only the OSI platform. It will be caring about a lot more platforms. Which means that the same unified kernel image will be. You can just take that image and give a DT and boot it, or you can boot it through the boot UEFI and give a CPI table and everything and boot it. So the hardware description, uh, be it DT or ACPI, will be chosen at boot time. Okay, so but you only one of them need to be provided, not both. So. Uh, so just, I'm not just sure. Like ARM, so just like in ARM, there is a single unified kernel which also boots as ACPI kernel as well as a DT kernel. So yeah, I'm not sure my understanding is uh, correct, uh, but I think if we want to support Windows, we need ACPI. If yes. we just uh, if we just want to support Linux. Maybe ACPI is not so necessary. Is that right? By understanding? Yes, for Windows it's mandatory, but Linux will can handle both. So, but for server oh, yeah. platform, server platform we are kind of mandating ACPI so that things like Windows can also run on server. No, platform. but also, uh, also because the distro, distro that's what distro wants. All the yeah, distro wants uh, ACPI for uh, risk five servers. So remember, some uh, platform like uh, D1 or Unmatch. They are not aimed at server, so that we don't need ACPI for those. We need only for enterprise classes uh, ACPI because Distro wants to have the same environment they have for other uh, ISAs. Okay, thank you. Um, Sunil, there is another question in the chat. Uh, since uh, AI allows APLIC or IMSC to be optional, so is the entries in the MADA table are optional also? Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, IMSIC is not optional because we are talking about server class platforms, so we have to support MSI. Uh, but APLIC can be optional um, in, if we don't want to support wired interrupts. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, so with that, uh, we have done uh, some proof of concept work and the changes are spread across uh, QMU and EDK, EDK2 and Linux. Uh, uh, in QMU, uh, as I mentioned, all these uh, tables, mandatory tables, which uh, are required, uh, uh, we had to code. And uh, especially in the MIDT, like I said, all the interrupt controller information uh, need to be populated. And in terms of DSDT, like I said, processors, uh, peripherals, and then uh, applics, uh, this needs to be populated. And uh, uh, one more thing I have not mentioned here is uh, in the POC, we have done uh, enablement of SMIOS also. I will come to that, why I had to do that in the next slide. Uh, when I come to EDK2, uh, which is Tiana Core, uh, basically uh, for QMU platform, all the ACPI tables are created in the QMU itself. So 
uh, and it is passed to the EDK2 via uh, form a config table. So uh, we don't really have a lot of things to do in EDK2. And uh, only thing I had to do changes is to integrate with the latest uh, open SBI, which supports CIA and uh, some of the packages required to support ACPA table installation uh, uh, and SMIOS table installation. Um, majority of code changes I needed was in Linux. Uh, currently, Linux doesn't uh, 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 link with the ACPI uh, CA and other modules. So uh, all those uh, ACPI CA and arch architecture specific ACPI code I had to enable. And uh, uh, all drivers, like I mentioned earlier, uh, which are currently DT based uh, need to be added. I mean, we had to add support for uh, ACPA based uh, drivers also. The same driver will work with both uh, timer driver, interrupt control, local interrupt controller driver, and uh, IMSIC and APLIC drivers. And uh, SMBIOS, uh, which I'll explain in the next slide, uh, will be uh, also was added. And uh, uh, table 44, which is a new thing in the SMI specification, also added. Arish, you had a question? Yeah, somebody asked in the chat, uh, Rohit asked, will SR at S uh, SRAT and Slack will be provided by UFI BIOSes for SCI? Yeah, that is a NUMA related thing. Uh, currently, we are focusing on basic enablement of uh, ACPI, and uh, SRAT and SLIT will be uh, in the next steps. Okay, so, so I have what, a, sorry, I have sorry. A quick question, just following up on my earlier one about um, you know participation, and it's it's related to standardization. So, it it looks like a lot of the work that's being done here is being done to, I guess, a draft standard. Um, yes. And how do we? Is there any risk in terms of the the U, the UFI form and it, that some of this stuff might get? standardized or included into the spec before the the risk five international has even approved for example the aia spec or the platform spec yeah so um i have a slide uh, the process to follow um, basically we need to uh, uh, in the in, within our community we need to Within our community, we need to decide on uh, uh, the change request to the ACPA specification before we get in uh, get into the ASWG forum for review of the change request. So within the community, we will have uh, 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 change request review, and uh, once uh, everything is fine, we will send it to the uh, ACPI uh, group uh, to update the specification. And uh, before sending that, uh, we need to have uh, uh, specification like AIA and all should be ratified. Um, did I answer Thanks your question, much. Paul? Yeah, okay. You did. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Do not regard in memory in the initial memory. My voice is breaking. Mike, uh, your voice is breaking Sorry. a lot. Uh, Sorry, I is didn't get you. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's better now. Yeah. It's better now. Better. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, there are uh, pieces of ACPI spec related to risk V. Uh, I don't, I can't point exactly to the actual paragraph at the moment, but uh, the uh, kind of seem to be copied either from x86 or from ARM, and they do not necessarily apply to RISC-V architecture, at least uh, as of now. Uh, so how how can we update this to make them a, a better and less BIOS-centric what the ACPI was in x86 world? Uh, for instance, uh, the ACPI tables are pretty much uh, regular memory. They do not require uh, creating the holes in the memory map for them like uh, they do on ARM64. Uh, there are also well, several uh, things uh, very similar to it. How can we fix uh, the standard? Uh, so if I understand correctly, Mike, uh, your question is, uh, uh, in the existing ACPI specification itself, uh, there are some problems uh, for every architecture. How do we fix it for RISC-V? Uh, 
Yeah. There are problems, particularly for risk five, that probably copied from other architecture. Uh, how can we fix it before it becomes widespread and the global accepted? So hey, like that. Um, sure. Yeah, we 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 looked through and found a bunch of stuff that was like clearly copied from other architectures and not relevant to risk five in EFI, UFI, whatever spec. Yeah, UFI spec, I think uh, it is updated for RISC-5. I don't think uh, ACP spec has been updated for anything for RISC-5. This is the first time we are discussing uh, some of these details. Uh, UFI spec uh, probably is updated uh, uh, for RISC-5. Uh, some uh, text uh, is there yeah, for UFI. Uh, so, um, UFI has a, we got the ECR approved and it's part of the official UFI spec. It should be part of the official UFI spec by now uh, it was done sometime earlier this year so or, um, yeah the last uh, yeah mike uh, probably you can send uh, email to the alias uh, we can probably take a look if there are any problems with uh, just copying the things from other architecture and they are not correct for risk i think uh, probably we can uh, edit uh, raise one more uh, ecr you can send the mail uh, with details whatever you find Okay, I'll try. Yeah, thank you. you. Okay. So it's okay to change released specs in incompatible fashions in, in EFI it, land? Yeah, we need to see uh, what change exactly. And uh, yeah, if it is not. I mean, it should be a bunch of stuff that's not implemented anywhere because it's kind of not relevant. But it'd be better to get rid of it now rather than be saddled with it. Like but, shipping stuff. Uh, but I don't think uh, it will be changed like in all the older version, right? Let's say if your version is, uh, sorry, uh, the ACP spec version is at X. We yeah, have a we Y just version. Set some minimum spec version or whatever yes, for uh, all this stuff and, and get yeah, all the we right? have like that in, I, Likely no one's really seriously implemented the other stuff and is like shipping it in production or whatever. So we can probably live. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, we do have that uh, in the platform spec saying, uh, Pointing to specific, let's say, EBVR version or specific UFI versions, uh, which are all external specs. Uh, same for internal specs as well. Uh, hey, I had a question. Uh, you're talking yeah. about how the same driver would handle uh, ACPI and DT devices. I was just curious on a tangential note. Do you have how many devices have you DT devices have you kind of ported over to ACPI? And is there like an ACPI source file that I can kind of look at? I'm kind of curious how that's going. Um, we don't really need to port everything uh, because, uh, like I said, uh, the UR driver, for example, we did not need to uh, do any changes for that because uh, you can send uh, uh, most of the drivers are kind of standard and. Uh, if we need something special, we can use the DSD property, which is uh, which can be used to populate, uh, communicate the properties. So I have not done apart from the timer and uh, interrupt controller drivers. None of the other drivers I had to uh, make any change for supporting ACPI. Okay, so um, we can take it offline if you need them. But I was kind of curious yeah. how uh, if you have OF compatible, if you're matching with compatible strings, how you're going to get it to work with uh, ACPI. Yeah, yeah, so, sure, sure. We can, we can. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one of the uh, uh, thing in Risk Five world is uh, uh, it supports a lot of optionalities, and uh, depending on the implementation, uh, different CPUs will uh, uh, provide uh, different features, and uh, these fee option optional features need to be communicated to the OS. Uh, currently, it is communicated via DT. Um, uh, some examples are like ISA extensions, MMU type, etc. These are really essential for booting. Uh, so the question is, how do we communicate uh, this information in ACPI? Because uh, this is something special uh, for RISC-V. And uh, uh, SMIR specification has added a new table called Table 44, uh, specifically for this purpose. And uh, I, in my POC, I use this initially, SMIR specification, but and uh, uh, communicated this hard capabilities to the OS. However, this makes it SMBIOS mandatory along with ACPI just for booting also. So this is where I got feedback from few people that uh, we probably need to add 
this information into the acpi itself not depend on uh, asmbios uh, for this purpose so one proposal i have is uh, there is no i mean one thing i wanted to avoid is to uh, come up with a totally new table into the acp specification so whether whatever is possible we can reuse so one table which looks closer to me is processor properties topology table this specific specifically currently used to provide the processor and cache hierarchies information uh, for our performance optimization so it's not really mandatory for booting but my proposal is for risk 5 we will add this one more structure into this table and uh, make it mandatory uh, instead of um, instead of uh, defining a new table altogether uh, again uh, these are things which are uh, still yet to be discussed with acpi group also but uh, if you are have any if you have any feedback uh, that will be helpful what option you want to have whether we should use smbios or uh, pptt or uh, new table altogether so there is a question in the <coughs> chat from alex um, did we get a concrete request from any of the os that uh describe is uh, sorry uh acpi is mandatory for a server platform or it's just the experience from the rm64 yeah definitely it's an experience i think uh, we got uh, requirements from os distros also uh, specifically i think uh, rel and uh, uh, I think VMware is also kind of interested uh, because they also don't work with uh, non-ACPI platforms. So, and uh, uh, Kumar, you have any other inputs on other uh, OS vendors? I, I'm pretty sure this question has come up at every plumbers, and there's always been some distro folks in the room to say that they need ACPI. Yeah. I think same discussion between UFI boot and UFI boot and non-UFI boot. There are distros ones that as well. So yeah, I think UFI is like a way way harder requirement, right? Um, right, because you there's like tons of stuff that you get along with UFI. Right. I think ACPI is more of like a tooling sort of thing, um, and actually like there's huge huge features enabled by ACTPI that could not be enabled by DT. Not 100% of that one, though. Maybe there's some distro folks in the room who can chime in. If not, we can talk about it on like a mailing list or something. Yeah, I, I would I would just say, and maybe this is a general situation, it looks like there are a lot of distro folks here now. I would just say, if it turns out that ACPI is not needed to actually make any of the enterprise Linux distros run on Risk Five, it would be really great for for folks to basically come out and and say that because it'll it'll help kind of uh, allow people to make some pretty key decisions about uh, what way to go here and what what level of engagement with these different organizations is is really needed. Yeah, I mean, so, it'd definitely um, be super awesome to have less <laughs> less device discovery mechanisms to support unless they're necessary. Yeah, right. and I would also just add to this that um, you know the, the the general conclusion right now is that this this is needed, but what we're really missing is we're missing the the, the participation of the distro folks in yeah. the Unix platform spec group. And so, um, if there's anything we can do to to help increase that because we we really consider you guys to be the main stakeholders um please reach out and let us know how we so can we help have, uh so we have already reached out to i mean in discussion with canonical and red hat so we had a uh, discussion and some feedbacks received from canonical uh is all here we are trying to get his feedback as well and other red hat folks and we're trying to set up connection with uh suze and other uh this as well so if anybody from Suze or Red Hat have any comments, it would be time to speak, please. Okay, we can continue. Maybe we can uh, follow up offline. Yeah, one, one question I have is, um, so if people are looking at this after the fact, what's the best place for them to get in touch if there's someone from a distro that has a perspective on this? Where should we point them to? I think a mailing list, our platform mailing list uh, is probably the right place to discuss. 
Uh, I think we also have a GitHub repo for the ACPI. You can also create issues if you don't feel like joining yeah. your mailing list. Okay, yeah, that that is also fine. So typically, okay. a lot of uh, yeah, people who are not generally, I mean, a lot of people who don't participate in this mailing list, they directly create issues. That's the typical uh, thing. So. Okay. I think uh, already time up. So let me quickly go through this next steps. Uh, we need to submit these ECRs uh, for the UE5 forum. And the NUMA, RAS, Power and Performance Management, Watchdog, all these advanced features we need to work on. And uh, some of the debug tools support we need to do and compliance test, for, especially for the new tables, what we are adding, we need to write compliance test. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, uh, like Anup said, GitHub or this tech uh, this mailing list you can we can discuss uh, if you have any questions later. And uh, I have additional slides after this. Uh, you can download that and it gives information uh, where is the POC code and uh, uh, what are the links uh, to the ACPA specification. Uh, uh, I mean requirement specification, etc. So you can go through that later. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Is there any last last minute? Okay, thanks. No, no. So if you have any question, we can take a couple of them. Do we have anything in chat room, Atish? I have not looked. Uh, no, no. It's just generic discussion about getting the distro guys on board. So. Okay. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye. I'm just uh, looking for go to make him presenter. Uh, go you should have access for present to present. Uh, uh, okay, I can I can control. Okay, it's work. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to invite my partner. Uh, Fu Wei and uh, Liu Shaohua, yeah. Uh, let's start. Yeah. They're coming. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hey, okay, hear me. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Gwen, uh, should we start that right now? You control the yeah. slide, right? Okay. Good. Yeah, I, um, I have a control there. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, so first of all, uh, I'm, uh, I come from Red Hat and software engineer, and I'm, my name is Fu Wei. And so we're, welcome to this session. So now let's focus on the what's the problem with the D1 Linux this, uh, upstream. Uh, the main speaker of this session are Linux kernel developer Guo Lan and software, engin software engineer Liu Shaohua from Obina. They are trying to they are trying very hard to upstream the kernel patches for uh, Ovina D1. Uh, in this process, uh, I'm helping them to test the kernel on D1 on, with Fedora Imagine. So as you may know, uh, we have a policy called Fedora has a policy called uh, upstream first. So our final goal is to make upstream kernel can put on D1 without any patch. But now we have some broker, so uh, we wanna take this chance to explain our solution and hope we can get some advice, suggestion, and help from you guys to moving forward. To move forward. So I'm just a starter here. Uh, I'm not I'm starter, so I'm no no. Uh, I don't want to steal their sounder. So let's welcome uh, Obin a software engineer Liu Shaohua to make an introduction of D1 software ecosystem so okay so please hello hello everyone can you hear me yes okay yes. i'm liu Shaohua, a software engineer from risk file team of all winner i'm so glad to join this session and share my experience on linux kernel upstream for nota d1 D1 is the first SOC of Owner, which is based on T-Head Xuantian 906 core 
which is an amazing which file six for GCV IP. As you may have noticed that it supports vector extension. Noda is supported by several Linux distros like Federal, the Bean, Opaola, and so on. We are so trying to get more distros supported by interacting with more distros communities. For Atos, we are also getting a lot of support from different ecosystem partners like Artist Red, Free Atos, Ali OS Things, and so on. Many colleagues, research centers, and the ecosystem partners are using D1 on different interesting projects. Like Rust SBI, OS kernel, and security. For example, OpenCV and NCNN have been ported on D1. Okay, let's talk about the most interesting stuff. How does a Linux distro put on D1? Let me use feather image as an example. As you may get from the boot log, SPR is the first stage bootloader. Then it loads U-boot package with a bundle of DTB, OpenSBI, and U-boot. Finally, U-boot loads grub with boot federal like UPC by grub config file. For the status of, of this firmware, we can just use the upstream version with a few patches. Now let's focus on Linux kernel. For upstream kernel, we have made some drivers patches and notice that there are some kernel developers are working on D1, especially Samuel Holland from Boeing. Thanks to T head engineer Goren and Fuwei from Red Hat, we have boot federal on D1 by upstream kernel with some patches. But Linux is an open source project. We would like upstream all the patches. We need to make mainline kernel can boot perfectly on D1. So we would like to work with you to upstream the patches as soon as possible and contribute to its file ecosystem. Thanks. Okay, next, uh, my partner Goren will introduce the next part. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Now let's talk about what D1 needed in the Linux Arc Respy. After Linux Arc Respy supported D1, all drivers work of D1 would have a good fundamental base. And that's what the purpose today we needed to discuss. Uh, okay, uh, here is the agenda. Firstly, uh, I list the six, six points of D1 here that needed to put into the ARC RIG-5. Uh, uh, the first four uh, won't block D1 bootstrap. So they are not the highest uh, uh, priority issues. And we just have a quick review, quick review on them. Uh, and mention them here, we just hope audience could have a total view of the D1. Then it's, then it's the fundamental patches for D1. The most con uh, controversial visual topic is, is about the custom based, uh, page based memory type. Let's focus on it in this meeting. Uh, okay, uh, Victor uh, 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 dot seven uh, above. Uh, as you can see, above is the difference between the Victor dot seven and the uh, one po one point zero uh, one point zero. Yeah, uh, VLAN. It, we, uh, the VLAN uh, in our hardware is the one hundred twenty eight, 
which I have tested on our hardware platform and modified the QMU platform. So the only so the only difference is the uh, VLOAD and the, the some uh, bits changed in the CSR. Uh, the the vector uh, 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 the final vector have rectified recently, and we will send a patch after official vector implementation merged. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there is no not, not so so much gap between uh, seven zero seven and uh, one point zero for context context switch. After green times patch set merged in, we will use uh, alternative framework of uh, error in vector dot s to patch text. Also the 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 CSR register need global variables to init. Oh, and uh, and I would say all next generation T head C9 series processors would follow the rectified vector spec, but we want D1 get merged in upstream Linux. And uh, another uh, uh, next is about the performance monitor. Yeah. Uh, D1 has his own performance monitor, which it designed, which it, which it is, uh, which it, uh, implemented uh, two years ago, uh, and uh, and now the OS spec have some uh, so, some related uh, spec uh, of the PMU. Um, but uh, if you want to try try P, try perf record with the hardware event, uh, you can use this patch I have listed on our presentation. Uh, the code, the coding needs to be reconstructed before upstream to follow the new infra infrastructure as possible as we can. And the feedback, any feedbacks uh, are welcome. And uh, another, uh, another thing is uh, our TLB hardware broadcast uh, synchronization. Oh, and next is the, okay. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. And, and next is the I, I catch synchronization acceleration uh, in D1. Uh, T had the C910 series provide custom I catch in syn synchronization instructions. Uh, as, uh, you, as you can see, always based on the on the catch line, yeah. And uh, we can uh, invalidate the uh, by the uh, virtual address index and uh, all the physical address index and and uh, and uh, and then you, we need a, 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 a broadcast synchronization to flash all public lines in all hearts yeah uh, the right side uh, is the vdso patch which could improve the performance of the open jdk's jit scenario by preventing system call and uh, IPI, yeah, and I think the risk five, and I think the risk five would, uh, would, would, would define his own, uh, uh, maybe it's the same old instructions to handle the I catch synchronization, because uh, uh, from the computer science, we need we need a high performance I catch. Uh, invalidation mechanism, yeah, and uh, and the D one is using uh, C nine zero zero six, that is a cost down processor IP. Of course, with the high performance implementation, which need, needn't invalidate I catch lines, and just the synchronization the pipeline is enough. Uh, currently, alternative is only for VM Linux, but. The, but D1 uh, for the I, for 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 the I, I catch synchronization, we need a, a altern, alternative framework in the VDSO to support more platform in custom implementation. And the, and the next is and the next is the TLB hardware uh, broadcast synchronization. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, current risk five Linux is now using a unified SID mechanism between all hearts, which was inspired by 
ARM64. Uh, and this software design is very suitable for TLB hardware broadcasting uh, mechanism. And T had the C900 series provide TLB hardware broadcast instructions. And we could use an error data mechanism to patch text, just like Sci5's flash TLB page, this kind of thing. And uh, and uh, and and from uh, and uh, and why we uh, use uh, and why we add the uh, TLB hardware broadcast in our processor is is uh, is because from our uh, previous generation processor C eight eight hundred series our processors are designed with the hardware broadcast TLB shutdown. And the T-head C900 series was just uh, inherited from that. Also, it could be dis disabled by CSR. Yeah. Okay. Um, can, can I just make one comment uh, on that last slide or have a, a, ask a question perhaps? So okay. I, I think the, the alt flush TLB page was added due to a in errata at sci-5 it, it wasn't the result of like a uh an, in, an intentional design decision just so i understand these these instructions here these these are intentionally uh required here as part of custom non risk 5 features for for this t-head c906 design is that right um uh, you can think. Uh, you can think. Our TLB hardware broadcast uh, synchronization is uh, error data uh, stuff, and uh, it's fix. It's fix. Uh, it's just improve some performance uh, for our processor. We we also could support uh, uh, native RISC five local TLB flash. So so I I mentioned the sci fives implementation here. It's just. Uh, to show you how we how how we how could we put this in the Linux, we just put them put them in the our aerator infrastructure. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay, let's focus on the fundamental patches for D1 bring up. Uh, it's the most important uh, one uh, I want to talk today. And uh, uh, the uh, the previous four points I have mentioned, in they are just uh, uh, improve the performance or enable some function. Additionally, they won't bro block the they won't block the bring up of the D1. Uh, okay, and uh, and if you want upstream kernel um, uh, make work on D1. You at uh, you at least need to, here. I have listed five uh, uh, six six patches. Yeah. Uh, recently, we rebased this patch on the latest version kernel and tested on the QMU and all our hardware platforms, uh, including D1. You can try it by the Fedora wiki. Uh, the first two patches are for customer. Uh, page based memory type. The next three patches are from are for the DMA synchronization operations. And uh, the last one is just add the Sun C SOC in K config. Yeah. Let's talk let's re let's review them one by one. Yeah. Uh, first I want to talk about is the custom page based memory type. Uh, okay. um, and uh, just so you can see, and the left is the latest uh, uh, standard page-based memory type proposal. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and the uh, and the the right side is the D ones uh, D ones page-based memory type. Yeah, uh, in the higher speeds, uh, both the standard PBMT and the D one custom. PBMT all use the higher speeds to determine memory type, but encoding is different. So both of them 
So all of them would break the rule in current spec that the highest bits must be zeroed by software written by the spec. Uh, but the standard, standard PBMT keeps the highest bits zero with the normal catchable usage. But D1 must set the highest bits with the normal catchable which needs patch the uh, Linux COM code, yeah, such as the man -map c And uh, you can, uh, my first patch is deal with that. Um, and because of the normal catchable type, higher speeds non-zero, D1 also need, needs a very early error in it before the setup, setup VM. Okay, so so that means the 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 standard PBMT design uh, is much is 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 much compatible with the current design, but the D ones one uh, will cause some another uh, additional uh, effort to enable it. Uh, risk five page page table. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, uh, how we uh, okay. Firstly, uh, we need to add a custom protection map in it uh, for D1. Why D1 need this patch? First, D1 change normal catchable memory type higher speeds, which I have mentioned in last slide. Uh, if you if we put global variable in the uh, in the uh, traditional uh, uh, the protection. Definition uh, memory map definition, and uh, then it it causes a compare error with the memory map this dot c. You you just look at red side. It's very simple uh, because it's a static initialized, and uh, and if you put a variable in the in this uh, in this uh, micro, then it will cause compare error. Uh, standard PBMT needn't dispatch because it keeps keeps higher speed zero with the normal catchable memory type. Okay, so it's just for the D1. And the second patch is the error eight PG table at a customer SV PBMT. Uh, actually, both the uh, standard, both the uh, standard P, um, PBMT and the uh, and the D1's PBMT uh, need needs this patch. And uh, but D1 also need a earlier uh, initialization, uh, okay, because we changed the protection map. Uh, here are issues needed to discussion. Uh, one, the first is how to determine the standard customer and the non PBMT. Yeah, uh, from uh, I uh, in in uh, in my in my patch. I utilize the vendor specific uh, vendor vendor CSR vendor ID CSR to determine uh, which to determine which the vendor is, and uh, then uh, we can initialize it. And yeah, and the second is about how to compatible with the global DMA pool style. I mean, uh, such as the star, uh, starlight, yeah, starfire. Uh, big O V, yeah. Uh, how to say that? Yeah, the star uh, star five board is is built on the DMA pool style, not the PBMP style. So we 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 may enable them together in current uh, RIP five. Yeah. So uh, two things. Uh, first, I think we can rely on the DT. Uh, that's just my opinion uh, for the standard PBMT, and then D1 would be an errata of the implementation of the bits. And then, uh, if the DT property is not available, then we know that there is no PBMT for the Beagle 5, uh, Beagle uh, V, where the DMA pool style, global DMA pool style, will probably use uh, the DMA set and cast. And then, uh, that's where the I responded in the mailing list as well. Where we can have a platform hook, which uh, from the generic code, which would let us know that whether this platform supports uh, directory map. 
if the directory map is supported that means pb and that would be enabled only if pbmt is supported either uh, standard or uh, custom because currently uh, the generic code is based on all the macros but for the risk 5 since we aim to have single uh, def config for all the platforms like no no pbmt custom pbmt standard pbmt and uh, global dma pool so we can't rely on the macros because those uh, config those con sorry not macros configs those macros will be enabled for all the platforms yeah like so i'm not super worried about digging into the implementation yet like obviously there's been a bunch of stuff in there that's not okay because like atish is saying it defines uh i used to remember the audit defines like um uh, whatever it's called, you know, like uh, K, you know, how defines and that sort of stuff. They're specific to this device and will not function on other devices, right? Standard devices. So that stuff we're not accepting. I think everyone's on the same page there and that there are mechanisms to fix it, right? Like my bigger question is like, are we taking support for devices that like very explicitly are incompatible with the specifications? Right, because the specification clearly says that these bits are reserved, right? And there are things in these bits that's incompatible, right? Now we got the RISC-V Foundation saying that it's RISC-V and sending folks boards and all that sort of, sort of stuff, which is like very unclear as to whether or not this is really a RISC-V design. And that's my worry here. Um, actually, the PBMT is the uh, is is similar to the uh, current uh, current yeah, but similar uh, is different, yeah. right? The whole problem is that it's different, right? And what's there, uh, like the spec as written, uh, at least when I tried to look through this, like have these bits as reserved, right? That means that compatible implementations can't do what they want. Right? That's uh, kind of the same. You, but when the standard PBMD come in. The, the standard PBMT also will broke the uh, the role of the reserved reserved zero, isn't that right? Because well, the reserved bits are reserved for standard stuff, <laughs> from my understanding of it, right? So the standard can use those, but other stuff is not supposed to put things there because they might behave differently later, right? Uh, I mean that's yeah. like the same but, thing we had with the the um, the interrupt ID bits, right? Which are all reserved and then got repurposed. Uh, what Google is pointing to is uh, so it was a reserved bit until SB, SB PBMT gets merged in, right? Once let's say we have 1.12 with SB PBMT in, uh, it's a standard implement PBM. Those bits are reserved, those bits are defined for PBMT, and then we treat that uh, D1 implemented it wrongly. It's a gray yeah. area, but it's your decision. I mean. What I'm really worried about here, and this kind of is the same as the platform spec discussion, right? Is like, I don't want there to be a, a us to just get roped into supporting random stuff that did not follow the ISA, right? Like I get, I get there's going to be errata, but if you look at the, like the process by which the errata we currently have in there, landed versus the process by which these did it's obviously very different right because these are in there as like purposely designed in features with things that are incompatible with the isa right as opposed to like you know the the you know, like the spence vma address not being handled correctly right like that's okay that's a bug right and we can fix that bug by not adding any you know customly defined bits in there but by just using standard stuff, but restricting the set we use to a subset of the standard stuff on the systems that have broken behavior, right? That, that's like way more palatable because at least we know what that standard stuff does, right? It's in the standard. And the rule of don't, don't use this particular flavor of that instruction because it's broken is, is a very understandable situation to be in, right? Like I, I'm worried about like the semantics of these, bits bleeding over into drivers. Like what, where the bits are, I don't really care that much about, right? What I'm really worried about is like the, the difference between the RISC-V foundation semantics, which will hopefully be well-defined um, 
I, I don't know if this got finished yet, um, but you know, hopefully we will have well enough to find semantics that we can you know reason about the memory orderings and whatnot when those bits are set, right? As opposed to this other mapping of bits, which is specific to this processor or processor family or something. I, I don't even know, right? Um, I'm worried about those bits starting to bleed over into all of the drivers and whatnot that we support. Right? Like that's my big worry. Um, uh, okay, and uh, what you worried about is that it means the following and the vendors would won't, won't follow the Python spec, and uh, they will implementation the their custom bits uh, with this back backdoor mechanism. Is that yeah? Correct? Like I'm I'm less worried about the definition of the bits. You know, like if if we had the same semantics for these four regions and the bits were just different, I wouldn't be that worried about it. That to me seems like a perfectly reasonable errata thing, right? Just maybe someone screwed something up. But in this case, like the the definition of these bits is different as far as I can tell than the definition of the RISC-5 bits. And the RISC-5 bits are really what we want interfaces to be written to, not these if orders. I mean, if we just put it in the error and the, and the in and the outs, and the, and just keep them in the error and the won't export to outside, is that uh, all right for you? But, but I guess we just put it in the error in the alternative framework. Yeah, my worry is other kernel code getting written to this interface as opposed to the standard. Interface. Right. And if we're providing like these orderings to folks, then in practice, kernel codes can get written to that. Now, maybe there's nothing we can do about that. That's just how it works. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so, now, so what about the suggestion you, you could give us that how to let D1 upstream with the risk file Linux? Yeah, so there's a thread going in the chat that we need. So my argument about waiting for the specs to freeze is that if you want to implement a feature that depends on those specs, and you want the um, like you want that feature to be like compatible and maintained in the long term and whatnot, then yeah, like you you have to work with the spec committee in order to make sure that you guys are aligned. Right? If you go off and do your own thing to add some feature, then you know, there is a chance that software won't work. Right. Now, the wrench that's being thrown in the works here is that these are the boards that are getting delivered to everybody <laughs> as like the example developer board. And like, how do we tell everybody just like, oh, yeah, sorry, like your hardware is not supported, despite it obviously being the preferred hardware from the RISC-V folks. Uh, yeah, it's, th there seems to be this, this kind of split brain thing going on where uh, some of the folks I've talked to are saying things like, well, the, the, the non-privileged side is compatible with RV64i and they didn't diverge there, but, you know, they, they clearly did diverge on the, uh, on the S spec. Uh, and so I, I think folks at the foundation, my understanding are, uh, are reevaluating the, the, whether it makes sense to, to keep keep doing what they're doing now. I don't know what the, the practical uh, outcomes of that decision will be though, or those. those yeah, discussions. I, I mean, to me, that's the big issue here. And like, if this is, like, if this is how risk five works and you can do whatever, and it's still a risk five design, then we'll have to <laughs> figure out how to deal with it. Right? Um, and that may mean just, you know, yeah, sucking it up so, and dealing with all of the resulting chaos, but it's going to be a lot of work. So, Palmer, who was the last say? Is it uh, like, do you want RBI to conclude on anything, or like, we need to reach a conclusion, right? So, yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I'm not really sure quite what I'm asking for. Um, you know, I mean, isn't it also significant that this is the only mass-produced SOC, and also the only mass-produced SOC that's really on the horizon. Um, no one else is doing mass production for an SOC that we could actually build Linux systems with. Um, so, I mean, there's that practical consideration, right? It is special, right? Like, it, like no one else has done this, right? And I don't yeah. think 
I think that will be too. Like that's, that's a double-edged sword, right? Because if we start like for the B0.7 stuff, if we start providing that to user space, that's what everyone's going to write their code for, because that's what folks do, right? And like that, that is what, you know, it, it is going to end up supported. And then we have this other problem of there being a second package. Right? Yeah, I so think, you know, this is one of the big challenges here is that, you know, for the T head guys, whether you guys know it or not, like you're basically creating a risk of forking the architecture that's in a direction that's not where the, the risk five foundation is going right now. And I guess I would just want to ask you guys, and I know you can't answer, but it, it, is, do you really want to do that? Because I think there's a lot of value in, in aligning and trying to align to the, the risk, risk five specifications as they're defined by the foundation. Yeah, this is why like, I don't really know what to do because it's not really our job as kernel developers to. But are we, are we going to wait like more. six months or a year to have a chip that supports these standards that aren't even frozen yet, you know? Like, are we just going to be QEMU for like another yeah, year? Yeah, I don't know. That, that's the problem. Because if we do that, right, like then suddenly, you know, this is all irrelevant. I, was, I mean, I in my mind, all winner gets a lot of credit because they're the only ones that have taped out a chip that's like mass produced, right? No one else is willing to do that thus far. Yeah, for some stuff like the vector stuff, there was a lot of confusing messaging from the foundation as to what should be done. Like, and that, like I do feel bad about that, <laughs> right? Um, so, so, sorry. So I think we, we, we have to differentiate between two different things here. So we have the page tables and we have vectors. So for vector 0 0.7, there is a, a solution on the horizon, which is going to make it an X extension. So it's not going to be called the, a vector, but a, a vendor extension. But the, the big problem here is, is really page tables because it's, uh, it, it really is at the heart of what the kernel does and how we can enable that. Uh, I think we don't have to worry that much about creating a precedent because these chips were designed way before the, all the standardization work that's going on right now and the branding work. So, so, so we're really in, um, in a phase of where we're moving from what was before into what the future uh, brings and there, there can be a way stricter way to deal with it than, than what we have in the past. And I fully agree with Drew here, um, waiting six months or 18 months for actual hardware uh, isn't really a good choice. I'm not quite sure I understand that point of view. I guess from from two different, uh, I would have two comments. One is is uh, I would say I, I don't understand how um, merging changes that are intentionally incompatible with the um, with the frozen risk five specs or ratified risk five specs is is not setting a precedent. That's that's one observation I would make, and I think the the other observation um, along those lines is, I mean, this, this idea about waiting for hardware to be released. I mean, this is exactly the same situation that anybody that ships code for ARM or for x86 has to deal with, except that people don't get that early glimpse of, of what's in progress and what's being discussed. Um, in general, you know, if, if people are writing to, you know, ARM64 code or x86 code, they can, they're, they're not trying to get their code merged before ARM or the x86 guys actually release and, and approve the specs. So to me, I think that's kind of the analogous situation. Um, Paul, I, Paul, I must say, I do agree mostly with this. And every time I'm having this discussion, I feel a bit uneasy about the, the implications of moving this forward. But at, at this point, it's really, uh, it, it feels like we're between a rock and a hard place, especially with this board being very widely available, the, the foundation shipping it uh, to users. And the, the, the question on the path forward for me is more, can we enable that in such a way that we do not burden uh, the spec compliant implementation and that we quarantine it and, and modularize it in the kernel um, and, and less um, about the principle because 
unfortunately, in principle, I tend to agree. But I'm I'm trying to 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 walk a, a more pragmatic way on this one. Yeah, I mean, like. I think that's the problem here is that it's not the situation we want to be in. <laughs> I don't think it, I, yeah, but like how, how we have to live with it, right? Because it's real world, right? Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, I think that's that's the challenge for us. I think, you know, we're just like everybody else that hacks Linux, you know, we like the idea of upstream Linux booting on, on the hardware that's out there. I think, you know, I've talked with just talking is, the maintainers, you know, we all like that idea, but we also, I think, have to be really careful with this this risk of fragmentation. It's one of the first things that that folks bring up about one of the negative side of of risk five, and um, the it, to the extent that this fragmentation becomes uh, starts to get out of control, it doesn't only impact us as maintainers; it impacts, I think, the entire. Risk five ecosystem and the value that's in it, and so I think whatever we do here, we just have to be really careful and sensitive to those considerations. Um, okay, if, go, go. If, I have one question for you. So, uh, is there a way to avoid altogether this P PMBT, your custom PMBT? Like, basically, if you go ahead and like have a custom compatible string in the the impacted devices, and then have a custom flush, uh, like how many devices are you impacted actually? Um, all devices needed a PBMT, yeah. yeah without PBMT. So it's USB, how much? Is, uh, MMC, what USB, all so Yeah, USB. MMC, GMAC, okay. uh, MMC, GMAC, all, all, use, all, all needed to work with to so, DMA synchronization. So immediately, so uh, see, the, the DMA sync part is okay because uh, the CMO is being frozen, so we yeah, can- Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Trap in, I so mean, that the, one story can be addressed. The other, the biggest challenge is the, the custom PMBT. So like, if we go the crude approach and like change the drivers itself and put our error tower crown in the drivers itself. I don't think that will fly. Not I mean, yeah. yeah, this is actually the worst idea because yeah. I don't think these drivers are specific to the SOC. Um, because so, generic drivers, so, so, so they otherwise, will be used uh, on future and and compliant risk five devices. I don't think driver maintenance will ever agree to that. So, yes, uh, the other thing is uh, if you the, the only downside of the custom global variable based approach what Gyo is seeing is that it will impact all the future platforms which are compliant as well. Because now you have added a load store in the path, right? So. Okay. Yes, I'm not just going to words about that. Yeah. It's like we can we can hide enabling the errata behind a K config, and then it will only exist in the in in the realm of systems that care about being compatible with this as a you know performance hit. Right? Like that doesn't seem too scary. Um, okay. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, when push comes to shove, like, any errata is going to have some overhead to be swapping between it and whatnot. But then, Palmer, then this platform won't be covered by a unified cover kernel uh, goal that we are trying, right? So, you, people will have to build the kernel separately for this thing. No, 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 no. Like, the big difference here is that that K config must be turn onable with all of the other RISC V K configs. It doesn't mean that that K config cannot be turned off. Right, like you can always build kernels that will not boot on a system. <laughs> There's two ways to really take out big options. Okay, you are saying right. the other way around, like have it enabled and people will disable it. Yeah, like if, if I have to flip a switch that says either boot on the standard stuff or boot on the D1, like that's not cool, right? Okay. But if I have to flip a switch that says boot on the D1 or don't boot on the D1, right? You know, boot on the D1 and standard stuff or don't boot on the D1 and standard stuff, that's fine. It, like, because all, all the drivers are necessary, right? Like all the other errata are done that way, right? Like we're not going to rope people into including every bit of support for every SOC into every built kernel, right? We're just going to um, <laughs> allow them to do that, and then you know, def config will probably support the common ones. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm just worried that that the common distributions will then always enable that if we have uh, masses yeah, of people out so. in the world. I'm just yeah, wondering but, if, you know, if, if but that's their choice, right? You know, it would probably go in DEF config as does the support for the other common SSCs. 
until this thing falls off. But at least folks who want to build like an embedded system that doesn't have this don't have to get roped into that. Yeah, I kind of agree with I agree with Palmer. Like Def Config will have all the options, and then distros or individual developers can go ahead and disable some of those configs. Yeah, like Def Config will have the set of options that kernel folks want because that's the rule, right? If this is a common board, it'll probably be on because I'll you know folks will have to test it. I actually don't have one, but at some point I'll probably end up with one, right? But like that does not have to persist into all kernels and forever, right? That, that's a big difference. Yeah, distros can choose not to. If they don't want to support yeah. uh, D1, they just disable that config. And, and it, specifically, if, if distros live in a regime in which the D1 does not make sense, right, then they don't have to take the performance. I, that, that, yeah. in, terms, in terms of code and maintenance, I'm a bit worried because we're actually dragging that code and DF dev path into, into all of the, the page table handling now. Yeah, I mean, so obviously what's in the current patches is not okay. We talked about that because, of the, but you know, I, I, I'm not convinced that the, the, the actual like juggling of the code is the maintenance problem. My worry is now we're on the precedent because that, that to me seems like a very dangerous precedent to set. We kind of can't do anything about that because the foundation is, is going that way. And, you know, it's not really our job to you know, prevent the ISA from fragmenting. Um, and, and my other worry is the, the rest of the kernel interface is starting to be written towards this. Uh, but again, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Okay, and could we use one of the code patching, uh, code patching paths, either putting what static called us over or uh, alternatives in order to hide the penalty? Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm not super worried about discussing the performance implications right now, because there are many, many things that can be done to deal with it, right? And I don't know, I haven't looked enough in there, but if people care enough to make this perform fast, then I'm confident that something can be done. Right? So, so I, like, I'm not super worried about that. But wouldn't that also hide the API fragmentation then? Or the interface No, because the, the API is like, what orderings do I get enforced when I ask for the generic kernel orderings? Because Arch code <laughs> right, and drivers and whatnot are frequently written to those internal interfaces, even if they're not supposed to be. It's arch code can't be, but anyway, that's my worry, right? And then we start bringing up all this stuff, right? And, and like, it doesn't work when we try to bring up the standard stuff. It's kind of the same as the worry about like the D0.7 stuff leaving over to use this. Again, yeah, I'm wondering I'm, I'm, if we could get the standard stuff in and use it as the, the prototype and then hide this behind the code, patch, code patching path. Is there no implementation, well, <laughs> there are no implementations know, of the standard stuff. It's not, uh, I guess we can't. I guess we can't move this in un unless the the standard implementation is here, uh, a, which at a just bare increases minimum, the pressure on the standard one. Yeah, like at a bare minimum, I want the standard stuff to be there so we can describe our interfaces in terms of the standard stuff, and then implement those standard interfaces to the best ability that we can on the D1, right? And if that means that there's a little bit of an impedance mismatch and sometimes you need to upgrade something, well. That's what happens, right? When you know the standards don't apply, right? It's the same as all the other errata, right? We we do them by you know providing an interface that's as close to the standards as possible, and then the vendor gets to live with the performance hit when they do something broken. Right? I, yeah, I, I, I don't see a problem there. So is that so? To is be that honest, I'm not sense? sure that describing this as an errata is erratum is even accurate. I mean, it's, it's to me, it's clear this isn't even in, it, these aren't errata. <laughs> I, right? I, so, I think at a philosophical level, it's not an errata because an errata is a bug and this is a feature, right? So it's not an errata, right? My worry is that that's kind of not our battle to fight. Yeah, because if, if we come back to the problem. fact that an error to usually results from somebody holding the specification wrong, I think then we have, have an errata here. Uh, I don't think this is a mistake. I think that's the key yeah. issue. Like, can we call x86 a risk five errata and have to support all of those systems? <laughs> like, like, it's nuts. And and Palmer, and uh, uh, and I want to say, when the standard P PBMT come into the Linux, that will cause another type of the page table base definition. That will bring the variable into the page table also. So uh, so why we couldn't uh, put a uh, error data uh, setup VM 41? Yeah, 
I get like a yeah, lot. Yeah, you have, yeah, you yeah. have, you have said uh, you worried about uh, that the following vendors would, would have the back door, the back door, and then yeah, they want to the worry. ISA. Yeah, that's your worried. Like um, we, we will figure out a yeah. way to implement the the, the things yeah. that we need. How do you know? How do you? But you know, when we when we design V one, there is no specification about the PBMT or the how to deal with the DMA uh, concurrency synchronization. Yeah, there is. Why, it's why is <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, That's what everybody be, else did, and their systems work well. Actually, they don't. there were PMS. You could have used PMS, but so yeah, PMBT is like yeah. is like this addition. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, you know the uh, you know uh, the the O winner is is from. Is uh, the the old winners previous SOC is designed uh, in ARM, and they are all PBMT type. So yeah, I, I, like, I get the that there are so, many yeah, so things that are in cannot, ARM that are not in RISC V, and that yeah, is yeah, yeah. So, and the SOC is based on the ARM. So we can, so that's why we choose the PBMT to solve their problem because because. The, their old drivers is based on the PBMT. So we, we needed to provide a PBMT. So solution. like I think yeah. Atish was saying, yeah. like the, the PMAs were the proposed way to deal with this in RISC-V and other systems have non, non-cacheable memory via yeah, yeah, yeah. PMAs and those yeah, yeah. can yeah. touch non-coherent devices. So like there was a mechanism for doing this. You picked a completely different mechanism. I get that mechanism looks like the R mechanism and we're going to have it soon. Uh, you know, I, I kind of lost track of exactly where the specs are because everything's getting released right now. But you know, like it's my, my point is that it's philosophically not in a wrap, right? It, it is a conscious choice to add, to, to do something in a way that was not compatible. Okay. Well, two, I have two questions for you. Well, one is that like this will be a direct exception for the reach, reach five patch as, acceptance policy, right? And the other question is, okay, we go this route, add this uh, K config option and also and, it, and put this in an errata, but then this should not set a bad example for future things, right? So uh, this should be have some timeline and after some years, like it should be removed actually totally from the kernel. Well, <laughs> I yeah, that stuff is the kernel. <laughs> yeah. There will be one guy who will be still running uh, yeah. all in a D1 after 10 years. So he's like, yeah. uh, but Once it's in, it's in forever-ish, right? Uh, yeah, that, that we're not breaking those rules. We're already breaking enough yeah. rules. So I, I think there is no point in discussing why it was done. It's already done. It's in silicon. We can change it. Now, whether we uh, upstream it or not. Yeah. So, I mean, at a bare minimum, we have to sort out what the standard stuff is going to look like and whether or not it's possible to... Yeah. So I think Basically. one thing uh, uh, I want to comment on the standard, like uh, SB PBMT is already in public review. So it will yeah. definitely be frozen in a couple of months. Well, that's why I was going to ask, is it frozen? Because it's super gray right now as to so what's it's in, frozen and what's not frozen. So, okay. Uh, SB PBMT and CMO, both are in public review. Uh, public review period is 45 days. So in two months, hopefully by summit, uh, it should be frozen. Unless well, uh, okay, so but they are not frozen because other things not now, not right other now. Other things get frozen before public review. Some things are getting frozen after public. Um, review. Well, actually, according to the process and the milestones, it gets frozen before it goes to public review, and it is approval ready once the public review and all the comments have been in. So, Those, are these frozen or are they not? We we can do this over email because I really just like we a have to do this over email because I actually have to go back and read those announcement emails again. Yeah, yeah. so this is a key like process issue with the RISC-V Foundation right now or with RISC-V International, which is there has to be some public documentation of, of these processes and there has to be some public list of what is frozen and yeah. what is well, more, I don't. I don't personally care that much about the process, but I at least need to know what currently constitutes the ISA. It, like, so it's, it's, it, it's nuts. <laughs> The process is publicly documented. I can pull up that link because I was looking at it just yesterday again uh, for other reasons, and it is an approved policy. But that does not necessarily mean that with all the 
uh, all the rush that's going on this year and at the moment uh, people are necessarily sticking to the to the process um, in or to every word of the process okay well we're on break maybe let's do this over email because uh, otherwise it's just going to be us all speculating because I cannot keep all the things in my head because uh, there are way too many so I will send a link uh, so I all up I think in the past also I've shared the links for the process and I also send I'll send an email uh, again with the updated documents. It's in the it's in the public domain, so I'll just share it uh, in the Linux kernel mailing list. And uh, uh, to answer Palmer's question, it's not yet frozen, but uh, it will be frozen by a summit, unless the um, world okay. goes on a wheel. Uh, I, I want to ask, ask the Palmer that uh, you forbidden any modification on the pip, on the page table base. That means you you forbidden any error data in the page table bit. No, I'm not. <laughs> like my my issue with describing this as an errata is that a you know at a phil philosophical level it is not an errata, right? That's the problem. Right now, it, like the errata framework could be used to fix this problem. I guess we have to look at the standard and what these things are and sort out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I, I would say the uh, the uh, the the standard the PBMT is uh, is soon ratified, and uh, all all things uh, all things is uh, is concluded. That that's he that it would uh, keep the highest bits zero. That means that means uh, uh, the standard PBMT will add the some uh, some some fallback. Uh, some callback uh, just follow the error iter uh, is enough. That means uh, that means we could uh, detect the DTS uh, uh, to uh, use using the DTS to determine uh, how how standard the PBMT is or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we but, can totally but, sort yeah. out how to probe this stuff. That's yeah, a solvable but, problem. Yeah. Yeah. So but the D1. Yeah. Yeah. D1s and the D1s just. Uh, Mm, just need some earlier initialization. I mean, and uh, and uh, my first patch and part of the uh, second patch uh, will do that, and uh, and the, and the, this of stuffs could be approved by the five Linux. Yeah, so I'm not worried about the early init of errata. Like the errata will be initialized early enough to make to make them fix the problems that exist. Right, like we've done that in other places. Yeah, like generally we don't carry around code that doesn't have users. So until there is a use case for errata being initialized that early, it doesn't really make sense to reason about how to initialize. Uh, yeah, I think what Palmer said earlier, like implementation is not the problem. We can implement it in a cleaner fashion. It's, we need to answer that philosophical question. If any platform has an incompatible implementation, whether that should be considered as an errata and allowed upstream right and 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 maybe you think that this is just a hardware um, error eight stuff not in capital in in capital stuff i mean you won't you won't see sci five's page fault is uh, incompatible uh, no but uh, they did not use the other two bits right so okay if you would have been used the only to those two bits it's just that uh, the purpose of those bits are different i agree but uh, PBM, uh, your implementation uses four bits while the standard uses two bits, right? So the other two are still reserved while D1 uses those bits for some reason. Yes. Correct? So the, 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 the heart of the issue, Guru, is that these bits were marked as reserved and not reserved for vendor use, but reserved for future standard use. And that's why why this discussion is going going on in this direction, and why the specific wording is being used by people. It, it uh, has to do that these that these bits were always reserved for future use. And also the like, except those two bits that are used by PBMT, the other two bits are still reserved. Like even after PBMT is merged, the other two bits are still reserved, which D1 uses for its uh, for its PBMT custom PBMT. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the problem. Here and we like this is like very purposefully not to spec, right? As opposed to something like you know not properly respecting some orderings in SPNCMA, 
like the other board does, like that's clearly a bug, right? The, and bugs happen, we have to live with them. But there's a big difference between people who tried to implement something to spec, right? Like the um, Drew's board, the, the, the sci-fi one, had some provisions for non-coherent stuff based on the PMAs, right? Like they tried to do it to spec, oh, sorry, Atish. We're done. I think we ate our break too. So. We, we, yeah. we have to go on to the next yeah. one. Yeah. So isn't there gonna be some kind of boff about this? Uh, yes. Somebody, could you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, we'll talk yeah. About uh, so I have uh, requested a boff. It's on the Friday. It's on the, at what, 9.15 a.m. PST to discuss this and other things in the platform. So we can continue discussing there. I'll, uh, I think David already shared the link in the chat. It's along with all other bobs. So take a look at the right. bobs to do. Cool, thanks uh, guys. Let's go to, we'll talk more. We'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> let's, go to, let's go talk about it. I think, yeah, that's <laughs> one will never end, so. I know, right. all right. I'm gonna take a break for like a minute or two and hopefully Keto's here. Oh, uh, so, uh, so Palmer and uh, uh, you means if, uh, uh, if the standard the PBMT ratified, and uh, also the D1's PBMT couldn't be. Uh... So, so first of all, frozen, not ratified. <laughs> ratified yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. Frozen matters. Frozen is the rule because frozen means that the foundation folks are saying they're if, not changing. Let's talk. Let's yeah, yeah. Have Guys, can, can we, we take this to the point? Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, uh, if the standard the of PBMT uh, frozen, and uh, and then the D1's PBMT could be. Uh, again, patch uh, send patch to you, and then you you will review that. Uh, Guys, let's just let's take this. To, let's take this to the boss. We're all yeah. Ready let's continue on. Continue, on, continue it on boss okay, during okay. the Friday. During Friday, okay. We are already eating Keto's time. Uh, Keto, I'm okay. a presenter, so you should be able to switch back to your slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me try. Uh, thanks, Go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Turn off. Turn off video. Yeah. Uh, just make sure, could you see my screen? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, could you see my screen? Yep. Okay. And uh, it's it start or wait for you more break time? Uh, I think you can start your already. Yeah, you better go ahead and start. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, wait me for a minute. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Kito Chen from Sci Fi. I'm. Oh, I, wait. I, I forgot to open, create my, open my web can. Okay. Hello well, everyone, I am Kito Chen from Sci-Fi, one of the reservoir GCC port maintainer. And uh, this session, I would like to talk about the state of the iFunk. The, the title is the, the puzzle for the reservoir iFunk. So uh, the session will consist with two parts. First, the health is more like the tool chain stuff, how iFunk work and what tool chain need to do and what we are missing for tool chain implementation now. And the lesser health is, I believe is more like Linux kernel and the GDFC related. The design of hardware capability too, uh, let's kind of cross component and I believe here is the best place to discuss this issue. Yeah, so here we go. So first, uh, let me talk about uh, what is iFunk, but in fact, I am not intended to describe uh, the detailed implementation for the iFunk. Just give a very high level overview. And uh, those uh, text describers from the GDVC wiki. So uh, the key idea is uh, iFunk give you a mechanism to selecting the best version of function for current platform depending on the resolve function. 
and uh, most of the stuff are done by the GDP infra infrastructure and the behavior is also well defined by the architecture since the, the iFunger is already widely implemented in many other architecture like the x86 ARM ARC64. So ideally we don't need too much work to enable that for research file in theory. Yeah. But again the, the real world isn't so beautiful. So there there is why there is a session to discuss this. So what's the state of the Resurfy support for the iFunk? Yeah, Resurfy have some basic support for iFunk now. As mentioned on the last page, we have a GDVC iFunk infrastructure. And we also have our own relocation, which is the minimal protein for the iFunk, which is added by a, a last year. And uh, so do we have a workable proof of concept? Yes, we have. The sci-fi has an internal implementation, but it's uh, not a complete solution yet from my point of view. So again, that's why here is this session. Yeah. And uh, however, I believe we need iFunk very soon. Since the vector extension, data manipulation, crypto extension is coming. And, and I, I believe this time is true. The vector extension 1.0 is really has an official tag there. So and it, it's frozen. I talked to Andrew about it. it's actually frozen. Anyway, I believe this year is true. I, I, I know many people have heard of that many years, but it, I, is, I mean, it okay. says it's frozen and it's tagged, so there's no way to go back now. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so so I believe people will desire to have their own optimizer routine for those C library functions. For string compare is a very good example. We mean have a generic version for the baseline ISA and uh, uh, optimized version for bitmap manipulation and another version for vector extension. Okay, let's sounds great. It should work, but what we are missing for the several part. Uh, to me, I think there is three major issues there. First two is the tool chain implementation part, and the, the last one is the uh, uh, kind of uh, Linux kernel stuff. So let me describe the first issue first. We don't have mechanism to disable or enable specific extension there. So why it's a problem? I imagine that we want to build a GDVC with RV64 GC. Okay, now we want to build a vector optimized version string compare with RV64 GC V and another version for bitmap manipulation optimized the version with RV64 GC underlying ZDD. Okay, how to build that? Oh, okay, the most straightforward solution is. Let's hard call the C flags in your make GDVC make five fragments. Oh, and arch C4, RVC4, GC3 for the vector version and another for the BM evaluation version. Okay, <laughs> that's not good solution, but that's what we did in our proof of concept. And of course it's work, but I believe it's not a scalable solution. What if we want to build in a GDVC without a C extension? And uh, what if uh, for the RV32? Oh, of course, you can build a very terrible long condition check in your make file. That is possible, but I believe we don't want to see that. And it's, it's, it's impossible to maintain, I believe. So what we have now is, in fact, we have something like that. We have the option no RVC and the option RVC to disable or enable RVC extension, but we don't have 
uh, option for all other extensions. So yeah, we, we can only have a special version for C and then no RC. Yeah, it's, it's not announced for now. And another problem is uh, an arch option is could be a solution, but it's uh, kind of hard to use because an arch option need to specify the full architectural string in canonical order. So the so you mean think oh we mean using some simple string concat to make the build option work, but it won't work well due to it mean not satisfy the canonical order. For example, your arch is RVC for GC and realize VVB. Then after this compassion, all you result in an embedded ISA string and then you can build your GDC now. Okay, so currently we are considered to extend the compilation flag. For example, add some dash and arch equal plus V to append the new New extension or extend the modify the an arch uh, syntax there. Uh, suppose some modifier like plus to enable specific extension there. Or we have an ongoing proposal here is is do not require canonical order in the an arch uh, option anymore. Since the uh, order is, uh, to me, I think it's not really easy to maintain, especially when we have a bunch of extension now. Yeah, how many extension I will talk about later. You will see it's it's very long list now, the extensions. So currently we have some proposal on, on going for the extend the option no RVC and RVC to all, all other extensions. It's kind of introduced new syntax for the option. The, uh, the, the option arch, comma, and the plus extension or minus extension to enable or disable, disable an extension for specific uh, extension for foreign core region, or just reset the ISA, ISA string with the full ISA string and it will work with the option push pop. Yeah, so it will work fine with most existing code. Yeah, and I expect this could be supported in near future and it could be used to implement in the iFunk. So uh, next one is about the, the C, C, C++ label. We have the proposal for the assembly code solution, uh, but we don't have C or C++ solution yet. Uh, other target has provided target attribute space by the and option, uh, uh, function to compile with the space by target option. For example, uh, SSE, you, you declare a, a function SSE on the line func with an attribute target SSE3, then let's the, this function will compile with SSE3, no matter it's enabled by your CFX or not. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, Respite didn't define that attribute it. But to me, I think it's fine for shorten, since we can optimize those functions in assembly file first. Uh, but I, I think, I believe we must have a long-term solution to define that to make it easier to write in ifunc functions and uh, we, we don't have any proposal for that yet because i think this feature is depend on the less less as page i mentioned the adoption arc directive which is still ongoing yeah okay so come to the less part of this uh, this session, I think it's most important issue there is the uh, hardware capability is not enough to detect the ISA feature now. Yeah, the the hardware cap is using a similar scheme with uh, an ISA region layout. It takes the lower 26 meter, 
one beta for per x tangent for for example first beta for a x tangent second beta for b x tangent blah 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 and so on but now which why has bunch of multi data extension now yeah for example big family has at least 10 extension there a single letter vector and the zve profile zve extension means for the vector for the embedded process and there is five variant and there is zvl uh, extensions uh, to specify the vector length for the architecture and the the beta manipulation is a little bit better. They only provide a full extension uh, in this ratified package. Yeah, but of course, there is still a lot of candidates there, but there is only four here. And the last one is the crypto family. Okay, I I never remember how many extensions there, but I, I remember almost 10 extensions there. So it's some simple arithmetic. Okay, it never can be fit in the 32 bit. Yeah, even we extend the hardware capability to, yeah, it's never enough. And the most important issue is we don't have any way to detect the bender extension. Since the X bit only indicates there is bender extension or not, but which vendor extension is there? Okay, we don't know. So I believe we need to define the how it keep two or some other mechanism to detect the how it feature in user space. Uh, and uh, there is a major goal of this session. And then let's need to coordinate with the uh, kernel guys. Yeah. So in fact, I this issue I talked with many other people, so I put some I, a proposal I heard before, but and and uh, to write some discussion to to see any better better solution here. Or, yeah. So, so I, I think we need to sort out whether we're exposing like ISAs or implementations, because a lot of the time stuff like string copy is implementation defined. And given how big like the space of possible vector implementations are, I'd be super surprised if that does not even end up more the case. Mm -hmm. right, and like how, how we encode it is one thing, but first we gotta figure out what we're encoding <laughs> because yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, to me, I, I would like to encode in the full ISA string since I also want to uh, handle one thing is the vendor extension. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess my problem here is that like there is no way in the risk five ISA string to encode like microarchitecture, right? It just encodes the interface. All right, so if you need to know like which flavor of you know vector loads you should be using because you have different performance pathologies in these different uh, implementations, right? That like that's a very different problem to solve. But I do think it is what we will ultimately need to solve. Actually, for are microarchitectures we... encoded in the the hardware cap strings right now for other architectures? Well, for for. AX64 it partially is because the implementer and part number encoded. Yeah, that's the problem is that it, like all the other encodings of this stuff end up with like a list of implementations owned by a central committee, so, which does not work for a scrap. So I, I, I worked recently on the GDP code for AX64 and one of the uglier parts of it for iFunk is that they're actually testing for the uh, implement and part number in order to decide what to enable and what not to enable in addition to everything else. So for the regular um, questions that we might have, like, do we have Bitmanit? Do we have vector? Uh, what is our vector length? We should ideally go through something that is um, independent of the vendor ID. 
Um, the vendor ID or the part number and the implement ID are still going to be exposed um, even more on risk five as we have the JDEC ID of the implement and the part number. Yeah, so I guess so like, there should be a two level process. Yeah, it certainly makes sense to say there's a way to discuss the ISA, like definitely without resorting to some sort of table of vendors or whatever, because that's going to be craziness. <laughs> right? um, and we'll be able to solve the simple stuff by just looking at the ISA string, right? Because some stuff will just, you know, you'll pick the best one you have. Um, I guess my worry is if we pick something that only exposes that, uh, we are kind of painting ourselves into a corner. Well, for the problems that we're seeing on the tool chain side today, it's going to help. I mean, string compare, the question there of string length is, is the, uh, are specific instructions from CBB there? So that already helps. Uh, can we use crypto acceleration? Uh, as, as OpenSSL would ask itself. Um, that's also the presence of specific, specific extensions. Yeah, I, like, I guess my worry centers around the vector stuff where there's a much larger space of available implementations, right? I mean, may, maybe it's sane to assume for the Bitmanif stuff that like, if it's there, it's pretty fast. Um, you know, Hardware vendors always violate those <laughs> assumptions, but you know, whatever, then you get slow stuff. And it's probably not slower than the fallback. Right? That's, like usually, that's usually managed by overriding what you expose in terms of hardware caps and in check. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that like specifically faking hardware caps in order to get a different GLC string compare is like, the way to go there. But that that seems like a big mess. I mean, and, and honestly, if somebody really implements it so, and yes, I've I've supported a chip for 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 a long time where the vector unit was processing sixty four bits at the at the time, but there were two perfectly fine sixty four bit integer units. Um, so if if somebody does something, um, let's put it crazy. Uh, then they should go back and patch up GLIPC in order to actually um, match their implement ID to override the decision. Yeah, so, I, I guess so. I'm, I guess I'm less worried about this for Bitmanif stuff, right? And more for the vector stuff, where like the like how how you load and how you predict and whatnot is going to be quite different between different implementations, and that will not necessarily be exposed at the ISA level but it will likely affect which string copy routine to use. You're actually touching at the root of the problem because it's not just iPhone. Uh, if you have that need, you're likely going to have libraries compiled for different vector lengths and you need to put them into different library paths and match. So this becomes yeah, a problem like, for the runtime link as well. Yeah, so so like I, I agree that there is more than I funk to solve, but I think the same, you know, hardware. I don't know, showing user space what the hardware is mechanism. Uh, you know, it, it should be the same for all of those, or could be the same for all of those. Right? Does that make sense? Like, uh, and that's that's what I'm worried about. Like, I funk definitely is just one of these users. That there will be other <laughs> users of this. Right? Yeah. I mean, the, the reason why I said that with the library paths, um, if you're doing iFunk, you usually want to be quick in looking up and, and matching. But if you're loading a dynamically linked object and want to choose the right one, uh, you can do more processing, given that you have to go out to the file system and do some path traversal anyway. That's fair. I think there are, though, a lot of libraries that will not actually whack themselves into a different library path but we'll detect at startup which flavor of the library to use, right? Um, and then deal with it from there, right? Like, like that, that, that is a fairly common modality that, that, that is not iPhone based because they want to just, you know, basically kind of like a, you know, hacked up fat binary or whatever, right? Yeah. And that again, maybe, maybe we can say, hey, iPhones get the faster mechanism where we have some, 
you know, HW cap table that encodes the stuff that's really important that we want to pass through, and then the rest of them can just go live with it and parse, parse an ISA string or something. Uh, yeah, I love it. So, so maybe you're right I mean, that there, there are different implementations. I, ideally, if we get iFunk funk designed right, they can just provide different iFunks that set up the library correctly during startup instead of going out and parsing themselves. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I guess my I guess my point is that there, there there's definitely more than one use case for this outside of iFunks, right? But I do think that yeah. iFunks trigger the trigger all of the cases that we need. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Like I, I, I think that it would be a, a short term mistake to design around only exposing the ISA bits and not exposing implementation. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think for those info, we can split into two parts. First one is uh, just uh, the ISR three stuffs. For example, the the iFunk uh, in in iFunk's use case, we only care mostly we only care about which extension is there. But uh, Palmer just said uh, in some scenarios, what if we not only just care about the the yeah, I, I, I would also yeah. argue that right now we only care about what I say yeah. is there because, because we only have one vendor. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we're not differentiating between the different styles because there is one style because there is one vendor. Oh, yeah, that, that will hopefully change very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So, Actually, it yeah. already changed because we, we, we can't really use the couple of bits we have with B and also with the crypto extensions. So this is this becomes a variable length feature vector, just like with the the, the vector extensions and the vector length. So yeah. one part of the problem is we can't really encode it the way we did because there is no B extension. There is a CBA, a CBB, a CBC, and the CBS. Yeah. 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 So definitely all those tables with the letters and the extensions are broken and have been so for a while. And this is kind of just the first time it's concrete. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so, uh, that needs to get dealt with. Yeah. Anyway, I just go through some proposal I heard before, but again, I I I I'm not as I have don't I don't have strong opinion here since I believe it's more like the kernel staffs. Uh, so I just go through which proposal I heard before. First, uh, I think the first proposal is very bad. It's just extend uh, using hair cap to us extend the hair cap one. It's not working. It's because we just gain extra thirty two bits. Yeah, it's never announced. Just in the sure in the next page we have bunch of extension, and or we can treat it as a pointer so that we can. Kido, you only have three that. minutes, so maybe let's just skip the encoding. So we can talk about this on the mailing list. This is like we're not going to make a decision on encodings here. Okay. The, okay. The other thing I'm worried about that I think does warrant a few seconds of time is like how do we turn on ISAs and like what is the ABI there going to look like? Like specifically, are we worried about like the min vector length? And are we worried about the max vector length? In terms uh, of compatibility. By the way, we have a, we have extension to represent the minimal vector length yeah. now. Yeah. So it's getting better than we have we, before we don't have that. Yeah. So are we, are, like are we also worried about the I'm I'm as worried about the maximum vector length as I am about the minimum vector length, because the maximum vector length is going to trigger a bunch of overflows and stuff and we'll probably mm. break the code later. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, if you talk about the vector lens, I think the maximum vector lens is already defined, well defined in the spec, which is about is the 64 k kilo, kilobytes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess my assumption, and maybe I'm just wrong here, is that most implementations will be smaller than that, at least to start. Yeah, so yeah, state. sure. And sure. that hard software will get written that blows up when exposed with a larger vector length. I mean, this is yeah. like a super common scenario, right? Okay. So my, the, I think the decision point is there, do we tell people that that's just a bug and they just get to crash, right? Or are we going to add some mechanisms for compatibility into the probing stuff that says like, okay, well, we know this thing works and only expects 32K vector state 
and we'll blow up over that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Also, I just keep give this 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 stage. I think we we are not rushed to make some decision here, but I just throw some my thought. And this here is also some thought provided by Philippe before. Since we mean also using the uh, the AT platform or AT based platform, or maybe we can just define our own AT AUX vector value there. And the, the AT platform is already used in some uh, targeted before, but for Resurfy it's just set to normal for normal point for now. So maybe we can recycle those value to doing something that, but I guess we may need to reserve one of these value to for the platform specs, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, I just uh this uh Okay, sorry Kido. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, let's talk more. Uh, there's certainly a lot to sort out here. So um, let's try to talk some on the mailing lists. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, just just go <laughs> go through just a few pages, some special things for to fund song, fund Google for adding the iPhone relocation and green time for the kernel part and the Vincent for, for the vector in iPhone implementation and the Nelson sure for the for least some of approval concepts here. And in fact, there is also a few other puzzles, I, but I think it's not major pro. Okay, we gotta move on to the next yeah. guy, sorry. You know. yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, right. hey, Ryan. Yeah, uh, any further questions, you can continue in the chat room. Yeah. Thanks, Kito. Yeah, thank you. I try, I'm trying to find Philip to make him presenter. Well, then my I'm have... on the top. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. the yeah. So uh, I would have given ahead. up another two or three minutes just to discuss that AT platform uh, issue because that would really help us. But uh, let's jump in, change the pace a bit and talk about something entirely different, um, which is a tool chains topic and the compiler topic and infrastructure on that front. And also wraps up or touches on, on many of the other things that we have like hardware availability and how to get the software ecosystem up. So um, life is a bit complicated uh, as, as we already realized today because we are actually looking for enough uh, hardware out there, talking about um, touching desktop and server class systems with the platform uh, with the platform specifications. While most of the data and most of the effort has really gone into small benchmarks and also small systems. So RISC-V has a pretty good stronghold in uh, deeply embedded now. Uh, and an embedded, and that means that we've been evaluating our development tools and how to get performance out of this um, with tools like Drystone, EMVC. Uh, I know a few people have been running spec, not just us, um, but it has been significantly less effort put into it. And it's not surprising that these, these small benchmarks are favored by a lot of people because they're well understood. Uh, they require little resources and they're easy to work with. So as we're moving risk five forward and as we're branching out to have things like the platform specs, we need to expand our coverage towards larger benchmarks uh, prioritize improvements where it matters most. And uh, we've done some work on that that I want to touch on and also see how we can get more of the 
community into this and uh, additional groups to, to help us out on that. Um, so I know this is more of a kernel oriented group. So I'll just very quickly uh, circle back and summarize what the spec benchmark suite does and what spec CPU 2017 does. So this is a large standardized benchmark suite. Um, it covers both integer floating point, um, has plenty of vectorizable workloads in it, um, and covers both single core and whole system. So you run multiple copies, you run threaded uh, instances of the benchmark and look at how the system performs and scales up. It has built-in validation, which comes in really handy to figure out uh, subtle bugs in compilers or even in emulators. So just recently, we, we found a quite subtle bug in, in QEMU's spin manip implementation uh, based on running all of spec. Um, and it comes with well-defined runables. Um, generally, where it's coming from is comparing enterprise cloud systems, comparing workstations and servers. Uh, and it's trying to mirror real world workloads and allows real world benchmarking of Linux servers. So XML processing is one of the workloads, X264 is another one. Uh, and uh, even a slimmed down version of GCC uh, is a pointer chasing benchmark that's, that's in the suite. So there's only two drawbacks with that. The first one is it comes with a license agreement. And that license agreement is not excess, uh, excessively friendly of collaborating based on it. So everybody needs to have their own license and then you can share data and observations, but you're not allowed to share the benchmarking suite itself. Um, the other drawback is that it requires large memory and has considerable runtime. So while we can't really do much about the license agreement, uh, what we're talking about here today is, and, and what we've done over the last couple of weeks and months, is we've done something about the considerable runtime and the memory uh, by simply running it on, instead of on the target systems on QEMU and doing a lot of analytics on it uh, in order to qualify and quantify uh, how well our, our compilers work. Um, so some of you might wonder uh, why anybody is caring about that on RISC-V today. And the problem is the competitive landscape. So everybody else is optimizing for spec. And this is driving investment decisions. This is driving uptake of systems. Uh, or sometimes it's just generating good versus bad uh, media feedback. Um, that will reflect on, on how well the device is, is perceived in the market. And everybody else, and literally everybody else, so um, Intel, AMD have been, uh, have been focusing on that. Um, so ARM has had an effort going for oh, about three years uh, to improve their, their performance. There's a talk uh, that I link from Kirillo uh, at the 2019 GCC call drum, uh, ARM announced auto vectorization improvements for their architectures based on that. And uh, finally, Intel's ICC and AMD's uh, optimizing compilers have considerable optimizations for that, including structure optimization. Um, so for us, life is even harder than, than for ARM. So ARM had vectors. Uh, but they were just missing certain instruction patterns and could get the, the speed up. Uh, so for us to catch up with them, we will have to work on multiple fronts in, in parallel. So that means vectors, that means the bitmap map instructions, uh, and so forth. And generally, um, to do that, it would be useful having some tools that guide us and, and having tools that, that help us along. And right now, all of these new instructions don't really have hardware that, that, that we can test it on. So the methodology that we're using and the setup that we've put together at the moment is we're using uh, QEMU to emulate the target hardware. Um, 
that's quite straightforward. But on top of that, we've, we've written uh, a plugin to capture the dynamic execution profile. So it's doing similar things to what Perf does. Uh, however, it's doing that on a trace block level. So every basic block, um, in order to capture um, the, the frequency of those and also how many dynamic instructions relative to the entire benchmark are spent on each of them. After that, we do some out of band analysis on the captured data uh, for two reasons. So one of them is we're interested in histograms uh, to understand how the instruction breakdown looks. And the other one is that we need to really understand what are the hottest blocks? Why, why do they look the, the way they do? So the histogram data is quite useful in understanding if we are having good coverage of our instruction set, if there's instructions we wouldn't expect popping up frequently, usually extension operations, um, and uh, generally getting a high level view uh, if what we're doing is right. So for example, if there's no minimum and maximums popping up, uh, we have to dig in deeper and figure out whether if conversion is working. Um, and those are qualitative measures that we can apply very, very quickly. Um, and on top of that, uh, we're feeding current GCC and current LVM into the analysis. Uh, so compiling our standard benchmark workloads at the moment, that's core mark and spec um, with different settings and then running that against the setup in order to collect the data. Um, one of the drawbacks of all of this is that the analysis as of today is mostly happening by hand. So yes, we can do certain comparison like seeing whether uh, other blocks have gotten hot. So whether there's a, a significant change in the hot blocks uh, or whether instructions are, are hit that we'd expect. But to really understand whether each of those blocks, and I'll show some of them, um, is a reason for concern, uh, we have to go in and, and do that by hand. So as I said before, we're doing that with QEMO, we're duplicating some of the things that Perf can do. And the question, this begs the question, why not using Perf? So at this point, we're just lacking the right hardware. So some of this work or a lot of this work is trying to predict where we are with ter in terms of our compilers if certain non-ratified extensions were already implemented. So the software tools and the hardware needs to co-develop. Um, and then there's another thing, actually QEMO has unbeatable performance and access to large memory if we run it on a, on a large Intel server. Um, probably not the thing one should say in the risk five. Uh, community, but everybody knows we, we are waiting for the high performance silicon at this point. Uh, and finally, what we are hoping is that doing this approach and just counting dynamic instructions will be unbiased to any specific microarchitecture and should, for that reason, allow us to share data between the competitors that, that, that are collaborating in the RISC-V field. So we're all trying to advance RISC-V. But in the end, everybody who is developing a microarchitecture is a competitor. Um, the assumption behind all of that is if we reduce the dynamic instruction count, we hopefully should also make things run faster. Uh, yes, there's always corner cases in, in microarchitectures, but that will have to be dealt by, by individual vendors. Uh, now, I'll show some example use cases just to illustrate how this has been coming in handy over the last months and what sort of questions we started to look in using this methodology. So um, instruction histograms to just look at how valuable is Bitmanib or the, the, the various sub extensions of it. Uh, what's going to be the expected benefit of, of, of CBO zero and can we confirm that it works? So how do we identify targets for it? Um, and then I have uh, one or two examples of code generation quality in the backend uh, that we're currently working on that have fallen out of this. So maybe the first and easiest question since I, I, I was talking about the histogram generation is 
how CBA BCS are we? I mean, the slide was originally titled how bit many are we? Uh, but given that we've broken it up into four sub extensions, uh, it doesn't sound as sexy anymore. The using this approach and using this 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 methodology uh, allows us to really run each one of these major benchmark workloads. So there's Perl in there, there's GCC, um, there's Blender, uh, B Waves X two six four, and Xalem against various compiler options. Do that automatically, collect that, and look at how likely are these, these things going to, to, to help. Um, and this information tells us two things. Number one, uh, we see that these instructions do generate significant values. So if I get 10% um, of, of all instructions being addressing instructions in a benchmark, and these addressing instructions generally replacing two or three individual instructions. Um, this is going to reduce our uh, dynamic instruction uh, count significantly and also accelerate things. At the same time, it tells hardware vendors um, how they could optimize or how much they could win if they support these extensions. So that is data that is equally valuable for, for us on the toolchain side and on the hardware development side. Um, another question, and that is, is actually quite old data because the postfix zero extension was removed, uh, was how does the instruction count really change if we have prefix zero extension and postfix uh, zero extension? And should this be really included? So quantitative data of ISA development. And it turns out that there wasn't really a movement. So you have prefix only, you have postfix as well nothing really changes. And that indicates that we'd just be wasting opcode encoding space and generate complexity for the compilers if we'd include a feature like that. Uh, but now after the histogram data and just uh, looking at the, the large scale quantitative effects, um, a lot of people are probably wondering CBO.0, how useful is it? I mean, in the current space, it, it makes perfect sense. We need to zeroize pages before we allocate them and hand them out to uh, to the user space. Um, however, there's one interesting benchmark that pops out, which is GCC. Um, and surprisingly, we see about 2.7. Uh, so I'm, I've only included the t two of the elements. So there's more recurrences because otherwise the, the number would be wrong. 2.7% uh, of dynamic instructions spent in an unrolled loop that stores 64 bytes. So if one looks into the code, if one looks into the call chains, um, this is always called as a mem set uh, with, with setting it to zero. Um, if we replace the, the, the sequence of SDs with a single CPU 0.0, so uh, 64 bit cache block size, cache block operation uh, that would write zero. This would be reduced by 1.855% of total dynamic instructions, uh, probably making the benchmark approximately that much faster. If somebody has a micro architecture, can't process so many stores, but has a fast CBO zero, they might see an outsized benefit. If they can get rid of the, the stores very quickly, uh, it might be a bit less. Um, but generally speaking, CBO.0 is shown with that to have a real world application and make things faster, even if it's just in the one point something percentage range, um, just based on, on that quick analysis. Uh, another example would be spotting trouble in the back end. So that one was actually quite, quite surprising. Um, just reviewing, so this is coming from XC. Uh, from the uh, compression decompression benchmark. And looking at it, um, there's a sequence that just smiles off. So a lot of zero extensions, which are those at dot Ws, uh, following each other uh, and not much happening. So when, when, when looking at that more closely, uh, 
it becomes apparent that this has to do with how the minimum is computed and that there's just a bit of uh, backend work necessary in order to make sure that we can eliminate some of them. And when, when looking even more closely, um, there's also opportunities to use bit management structures or different bit management structures in case of the shared to, uh, the, the shifted by two add and the, the adds. Uh, in the end, this turned out to be a 35% reduction for this specific block, which would reduce the dynamic instruction count by 1.8. Again, your actual speed up is going to, to vary with microarchitecture. Uh, but if you make a basic block that, that has significant runtime on the benchmark or significant dynamic instruction, uh, instruction count uh, shorter by a third, you're going to have some remaining benefit. Um, and finally, the, 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 most, the most surprising one uh, from my collection of, of issues that I went through in our tracker was uh, a zero extension that was nonsensical um, and could have been eliminated, uh, but, uh, but, but was stubbornly refusing to, to disappear. And when looking at the, the intermediate output, the debug output, it turned out the compiler actually saw the opportunity to eliminate it in its redundant, uh, in its redundant ex, um, extension elimination pass. However, it decided not to. And that deciding not to can be directly traced back to a fix me uh, in the GCC code that, need, that will need to be addressed in order to get the best benefit out of it uh, for, for risk five. So in general, uh, we're proposing to have um, a method that goes from QEMU through plugins uh, in, into an analysis and sharing that data across the entire risk five community in order to identify and drive our, our compiler development. Um, so we have a backlog of things we are we're working on. So one of them is to contribute the tools, which are the QEMU plugins back to the community. So uh, one of the things that has come out of the work is that we've already uh, submitted updated patches for, uh, for the CBA, B, C and S um, extensions upstream into QEMU. Uh, we have some code generation issues to address at the moment. Our own tools and our plugins should eventually become uh, multi-thread safe, uh, which they aren't today, unfortunately. And then there's plenty of work to be done on the analysis too. So on the automation side, on being able to automatically spot common problems by reconstructing a graph uh, out of a basic block and then um, identifying nonsensical extensions, for example, and finally adding more benchmarks uh, to improve coverage. Uh, plus finally also to do this in more uh, configurations because right now the focus is, is on RV64GC uh, plus the, the B extensions and in the future, hopefully uh, some additional work with, with vectors, but the, the compilers actually need to firm up on that front because a benchmark suite like spec is not going to get a lot of a benefit without the auto vectorization being in place. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open the, the discussion and really say, uh, what, what faults does the community have? How can we move that, that forward? Um, where is it useful? Um, by, by asking if anybody else is working on spec CPU 2017 performance uh, and seeing if there's ideas on how to integrate that with performance simulators, uh, where and how we, we could get the infrastructure publicly shared uh, to have the data that we generate uh, available to all of the members. And um, what other benchmarks people would be suggesting and would like to, to see. And all of that with the goal of avoiding duplication of effort and also getting things to firm up quickly and get them into a state where we can submit them to the various projects. So it's maybe GDFC at times. Uh, this may be GCC or LVM without wasting the, the maintainer's time and to get this, this committed upstream. So again, we, we're having to play catch up with 
with internal DOM. And the intent here is to create a tool or to share the tools that we have developed in order to drive our, our catch-up game. So with that um, comments, input, ideas. So, Aaron, I've just seen your message in in the chat. Send an send an email to me. Is it uh, already available in the any of the mailing list? The um, the first parts are in the mailing list, um, but we are getting ready to actually push the plugins out. Uh, as I said, they they need some cleanup. Um, the first stage is going to be to push the hot block generation upstream into um, into our QEMO as a new plugin. So those patches are, are being readied at the moment. Uh, Philip, uh, so any of this uh, SBI PMU and the, the counter overflow and all those things will help if those things are there in upstream then? Um, actually, we're doing this in user space, so we're not doing full system simulation. Okay. Uh, but once yeah. these things are upstream, I, I I would be looking forward to having the perf results and correlating them. Yeah, that's Let what I was about to ask. Uh, instead of QMU plugins, uh, if uh, perf, uh, as of now, at least if you take my patches in all the projects, uh, it should work. Okay. Philip, Philip, one question. Do you really require perf record immediately or you need a, it's mandatory for you or you can just live with normal perf? Well, we, for correlating, we could live with normal perf. But again, we've, we've built this as a separate infrastructure. So we, we can even collect the data based on a whole system image, although we lose the, um, some no. of the disassembly information. So when you say whole system image, uh, do you mean uh, <clears throat> uh, everything that uh, collects statistics while the entire system is running or you're talking about uh, different privilege modes? Because you can filter them um, out with Perf as well. Ba basically, QEMO system. So if you run this against QEMO system, the, the most useful piece of information is, is this assembly snippets. And this oh, okay, process. got it. We're really focusing on user space processes at the moment. Okay. So because uh, that, that that's how we measure compiler quality. So, so do it, uh, for, in case you need path, do you need path record? Because that's also supported now. I mean, the patches are there. For QMU, yeah. Yeah, for QMU, of course. Okay. So it would make sense to actually correlate the information then. Sure. Okay, so I mean, Philip. Uh, so, what is the larger vision here? Like to create a database of like what workloads or yeah. what? Uh, basically similar to traces. So, what we 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 want is a database of um, of the dynamic behavior of individual of individual benchmarks. So, we we get hot blocks information. We see what they do. We know where to look on each benchmark. So that's why I said if we have additional benchmarks, we can generate more valuable data. Um, the other thing is eventually we'd like to be at, at the point where we can run this nightly, um, where we can run this nightly um, against upstream tool chain, uh, tool chains to just rebuild and run the compiler and, and this against multiple workloads and compare whether we get uh, regressions or improvements. Uh, I, I know this is not infinitely useful, uh, but it's it's going to be another quality assurance tool. And the other thing is um, LLVM and GCC have quite different performance characteristics still, or at this point. And this can also guide us in, in allocating resources to the various parts of the compiler, seeing what works on in the one project and could be ported or duplicated in the other one. 
So, so, so really, this is a tool that that or the the vision is to create um, insight into where to allocate the resources and where the trouble spots are, and predict uh, what gives us the biggest improvement for the resources allocated. Given that the the Risk Five community uh, has a lot to do and and definitely not infinite resources. Do you think this moving in a direction where it's also a seam point database or something workloads per se? In a way, yes. So um, Valgrind, for example, hasn't been ported to 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 Risk Five yet, or not fully ported. And um, we we recently looked at creating basic block vectors, which is seam pointing data. Um, out of QEMO and we just modified these plugins that we have. So that, that was actually quite an easy changeover uh, to move from what we were doing there to, to generating basic block vectors for some point. So um, I'd say the, the application and the use cases are similar. Um, our focus is really on analyzing the benchmarks and seeing what the drop spots are. So what the time is spent and why the time is spent there. And then comparing the tool chains, not necessarily for for creating sim point data sets for predicting hardware performance. Or maybe at least you can provide a, a simple framework if someone wants to take this and start creating sim points. Then uh, a, a, again, we've 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 basically run this with with slightly modified code and changing this over to create a, a basic block vector file for for the sim point toolkit. Uh, was about a, a week's worth of, of effort. Okay. So the the challenges are very similar, but we are approaching this, or we've been approaching this from the toolchain perspective, okay. um, and from a quality and quantification perspective, instead of from from the hardware uh, perspective. I think we are uh, over time as well. So, is there, are there any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other question in chat room as well. So, I think we can conclude uh, the session today. So, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everybody for attending it and having great discussion. I'm supposed to do the sponsor slides before we conclude. Do you want to run through those? Oh, you want to do the sponsor slide? That's what the email said. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. I think so, you can do it. Is though. there anything beyond Diamond? No, Diamond starts. So thanks also for our sponsors. Uh, Diamond sponsor Facebook, Platinum sponsor IBM, Gold sponsor Amazon, Microsoft, Silver sponsor AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat, Speaker Grid sponsor Colabra, and T-shirt sponsor VMware. And uh, thanks for Linux Foundation and the uh, planning committee for <clears throat> having this platform. Like, at least to me, this is the best virtual conference that I have been attended in last. I have attended in last two years. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, we do have, as we discussed earlier, we do have a Bob session coming up on Friday. Uh, it's in the calendar. Uh, it's in the chat also. Uh, the details are shared in the chat and in the shared notes. So we'll be discussing, uh, we'll continue the discussion on the platform. There's so also a bot at the GNU tools. Come. It's, it's, uh, yeah. So what's that about? Is it uh, a <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a bot with no scheduled stuff. So, you know, obviously okay. a little more tool chain focused because it's inside the tools. Tool chain, okay. But, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so please attend that uh, if you want to have more discussion on our platform. Uh, attend the toolchain one if you want to continue the discussion on iFunk and iFunk details, what uh, Kito was presenting, and uh, for the platforms and uh, D1 discussions, please attend the Risk Five platform specification BOF on Friday. I think um, <coughs> any last minute thoughts, Palmer? No, nothing for me. Thanks, everyone. This was a good one. Hello. We'll talk more. <laughs> we'll always talk more. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Good evening. Uh, good night.
Thank so you. I'm supposed, to, right. I'm supposed to click end meeting now, right? Instead of leave meeting. I have I'll no just, idea. It probably uh, says somewhere in the documents. I'll just do leave meeting in case. Okay, so we might need to click end meeting because I think we're not supposed to leave them running. Let's maybe, why don't you click leave meeting and then I will try to read the document. <laughs> try to figure uh, out what sure. to click. Unless you okay. want to do it. I'm happy, I'm happy to be done with my responsibilities for now. <laughs> Anyways, I think we are done with the meeting. So end meeting makes sense. I'll just do end meeting. Thanks. This action will end the session for 27 active users. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Take.